So that uh, that speaker vote in the House was something else. And uh, we watched, I think, McCarthy lose. What was it, 15 times? 14. 14 times. The 15th was when he won. So anyway, I'm losing my voice. I didn't do my uh, normal morning segments. And we're just going to jump into it and talk about what's going on with Congress because Matt Gates is here. And he's already told us a whole bunch of crazy-ish that we're like, that can't be true. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. So let's just jump into the show. Smash the like button. Subscribe to the channel. Become a member at TimCast.com. We got everybody here. Let's do a quick round of introductions. We're hanging out with Matt Gates. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. I think everybody knows who you are, but brief introduction for those who maybe don't. I represent Florida's first congressional district. Been in Congress since uh, my election in 2016. I'm on the Armed Services and Judiciary Committees. Right on. I, for now. <laughs> for now. <laughs> hey, guys. My name is Zuckerdowski here of WeAreChange.org. Today, I'm wearing a very eloquent, polite statement, perfect for dinner parties, that says Joe and the blank got to go. Uh, a shirt that you could get on thebestpoliticalshirts.com because you guys do that. That's why I am here. Thank you again so much for having me. Ian, I'm, I'm you? really glad you're here, man. Hour away from D.C. We are there about. This should be happening frequently to get the word of the people out from our representatives to the people. Let's see, you keep using this tech. Anyway, let's keep going. Serge, what's happening? And I'm Serge.com. What's up, guys? Stoked that you're here. It's going to be a good one. All right, let's just jump into it. So, um, Matt, you stood up to Kevin McCarthy, to the GOP establishment, several times as an understatement. And uh, we, we watched for, for that you know, week or so, and we were laughing the whole time. Uh, I, am, I am stoked that you're here because I think what you did was awesome. But I'm curious to learn about the details. So... I heard about this shadow document. Apparently, you and several others cut some kind of deal or finally got McCarthy to cave in and give you guys something. Then we heard there's going to be a, a floor vote to abolish the IRS. Just, just, just tell us what's going on because, you know, we're getting it all secondhand. Uh, look, we believed that Washington was broken. The normal system of selecting leadership in both parties is based on the redistribution of lobbyists and special interest money. Like if you want to be the leader of your party, you basically have to raise and redistribute north of $100 million. And Kevin McCarthy was so good at that, he raised and distributed about half a billion dollars over the course of the last election cycle. And so it creates a covenant that's not really built on trust or merit or vision, but trading money for political support. And we wanted to send a shock to that DC cartel system and to say, no, guess what? There's gonna to have to be a different way you get there. And uh, the concessions we sought principally fell into like three buckets. Policy, we wanted specific bills coming to the floor. We wanted commitments on when they would come to the floor. We wanted uh, adherence to specific spending levels with a budget resolution. And the organizing principle of our policy goals was really to make sure that we would never again get an omnibus bill like we had to vote on there's just a total joke of a way of governing like how can we sit here and honestly say that bills that are thousands of pages of long that spend 1.7 trillion dollars and that you get 48 hours before having to cast a vote is really legislating it's not it devalues each individual member and it's insulting to our constituents to suggest that we even know what the hell we're doing when that's the way we we run the railroad so we had policy concessions second was procedure you know, having those 72 hours to read the bill, having open amendments. Like it's, it, <laughs> the youngest member of Congress was not yet born the last time the appropri appropriations process went through regular order. And that just means like, we should vote on the defense stuff separately and then vote on like the education stuff and then the health and human services stuff. And that it doesn't just all get mushed together so somebody can vote for a bunch of bullshit that you wouldn't otherwise approve and then say, well, I had to vote for it to fund our troops, right? That's the game. That's what the cartel builds and lobbyists make a gazillion dollars off of that. The final leg of the stool is personnel. Like in order to enforce the deal that we got, we wanted specific people on specific committees in specific leadership posts. And you know, what, what's the saying? You, you rob the banks because that's where the money's at. Well, we wanted far more representation on the Appropriations Committee because that's where the money is. And a lot of Americans don't know what the Rules Committee is or why that's important, but it totally governs what we get to vote on and what we don't get to vote on. And so we demanded specific people and specific representation on the Rules Committee. 
I think we're going to be in a lot stronger position as a result. Like the critique, I, I heard a few critiques during this process. One is like, this was chaos. You showed the country, you know, how, how rough and tumble this is. And, you know, you should have done this behind closed doors. To hell with that, man. Behind closed doors is where the American people have been getting screwed. And so I wanted to level my complaint on the House floor specifically. I wanted to cite the people that I was objecting to and their ascension to leadership. And uh, so I didn't buy, that didn't mind. And then like, it's like, oh no, this took this, you burned your whole first week. There are days in Congress where the only thing we vote on is the renaming of one post office. <laughs> there are days in Congress where the only thing we vote on are the rules that govern the next vote. And we take six weeks off every year for summer vacation where we do absolutely nothing. So to take four days to say, this is the policy, this is the procedure, this is the personnel that is gonna drive the Republican team going forward seems like the best use of time since I've been there. So that was the, the general construct. I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's amazing. Why, why was it only 20 members of Congress willing to stand up? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the frontline members even the frontline, and when I say the frontline members, I mean members that are in districts that are 51, 49, maybe even districts that Joe Biden won by a substantial portion, right? They had a loyalty to Kevin uh, and an argument that was something like this. Well, Matt, if a guy goes out there and spends, you know, four years taking money from the lobbyists and giving, them to, giving that money to us, and then in the last minute, you knife that person, no one will ever agree to be the valet for those people ever again. And we need that delivery system of resources. And so, like, it's not about how much we like or don't like McCarthy. It's about a system that we rely on to resource our campaigns. And, I mean, that's a pretty astonishing argument, but it, it, it at least has a logical construct. Um, and then, you know, there are, there are people who fear disrupting the system. They think, look, I got here to Congress. I've got a staff that tells me I'm always losing weight and that my jokes are funny. Like I go home and I'm the, the big cheese at the Rotary Club. And like to every extent that I can have calm waters, the better. And anything that creates turbulence, I oppose. And that's actually a pretty big swath of the Republican conference and the Democrat conference. That That is how the uniparty gets to groupthink. Yeah. And like I hear all this time these like these geriatric senators talking about like, oh, the importance of these great bipartisan achievements. But so often in my life, like the greatest moments of unity have been the worst for the people. Like, there's a shit ton of unity to pass the Patriot Act. Yeah, that's that, that you know, thing. We never thought it was actually going to be used against patriots. <laughs> we thought it was going to be used against, you know, Arabs and faraway lands. You know, there was a whole lot of unity over the Iraq war. Everybody was for that. There was a ton of unity for the COVID lockdowns. There was a ton of unity for just printing money and sending it to people that weren't working. And right. so like wh whenever they're the bills that are like the major bills that have 90, 95% support, that's when you need to be most worried at times. You fear retaliation? No, because we built the tools in that would, that would allow us to have the accountability. I mean, Nancy Pelosi is gonna go down in history as the last of the imperial speakers that centralized power and that then, you know, only doled out to members, oh, well, you can go rename a post office, you can go create a task force. Meanwhile, the macroeconomic decisions, the major cultural and policy decisions, all get centralized in the speaker's office, where a lot of the staff all went to like Northeastern schools and are afraid of things like fried food and guns and, you know, people who enjoy those things, right? And uh, Paul Ryan gave an interview on CNN yesterday that was really telling where he even confessed, like, I had too much power as speaker. Like, way, way too many of those decisions were made without the people who had spent years analyzing policies, uh, seeing which programs had varying levels of efficacy. And so while, you know, McCarthy, I think to his credit at the end of the day, was willing to devolve a lot of that power, we reinstituted the one member motion to vacate the chair. So for any reason, at any time, any member can go to the floor and call for a vote and to remove the Speaker of the House. And if 218 people vote for that motion, then the Speaker is gone. Now, I don't want to use that. I don't intend to use that. But I think having it on the books is healthy for the institution so that there isn't fear of retaliation for doing what's right. Yeah, it is. The Speaker works for us, we, the people, and should be 
on a, on a whim taken out. I mean, I think that those people are there to represent us. If they're not representing us, should be removed instantly. I love that idea. Thank you. I mean, well, they should look, at least read the bills, right? If you're going to pass a bill, if you're going to pass a law, read them well, for, me, for freak's sakes. One, one of the, <clears throat> man, one of the things Ian's brought up is that it should be illegal to, pat, to, vote, to vote on a bill that you didn't read. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, then we wouldn't be taking many votes. I mean, it's good. You know, for, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like that. You know, that, there was a moment during all of this where people were like, well, Gates, if you you and your 20 holdouts stay that way, then we won't even be able to organize. And I'm thinking, well, it'd give us a lot of leverage on the debt limit, you know, yeah. if, we, if we didn't constitute the House. So, yeah, maybe sometimes, like, you know, um, a reflexive legislative body isn't what's good for the country. Yeah, maybe less government is good, which which I think historically that 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 point is proven many times over and over again. But I think it's fair to say that there was also a lot of contention between you and a lot of other people. I know Donald Trump was also calling in specifically. Can you get into some of the contention that was happening there? Because it looked pretty intense. It looked pretty crazy. And there was also one specific photo of you sitting there and there was a guy in your face. And it was a famous video um, and, and a famous picture that had the caption, this is how we know uh, the deep state exists. And you were kind of cool and standing your ground there. Can you tell us what uh, what was happening there behind the scenes? Well, first of all, I don't get rattled when people yell at me in public because it happens like three times a week. So for a lot of members of Congress, like having your colleagues like upset at you or yelling at you, like that's deeply uncomfortable. And really that did not affect my week at all because what I knew is that our argument about how corrupt and how um, flawed the decision making is in Washington was getting out and that it was and that it was breaking through. I think the contention was overplayed because of the cameras. Look, a lot of times, like <laughs> the the late Don Young almost like pulled a knife on me on the floor because I wouldn't vote for a bill that he had regarding like sea lions or something like that, you know? And so there, there are always contentious moments, but usually if you just have that one C-SPAN camera angle and not the dynamic angles to see how people are interacting, you, you don't capture a lot of it. So look, you know, any body where you got 435 people, you got a variety of different alliances and opinions and grievances that change over time. I think that it, and one of the interesting arguments for term limits, and I'm very glad we're getting an actual vote on term limits because everybody talks about it in their campaigns, but they never vote on it, is that like the churn ensures that longstanding boomer grudges don't become a, go a governing principle. It's like now if you know somebody who's the lead person on financial services or on the Ways and Means Committee just hates you, like you're not going to get your idea through and they can just outlast you. Whereas in a term limits environment, those grudges dissolve every time the Congress turns over, the legislative body turns over. Hmm. You mentioned um, the debt ceiling a little bit ago. You guys are about to vote on a debt ceiling in right? the next four months. So I, my whole life, I've been watching them incrementally raise the debt ceiling over and over and over. And the thing is, it's from my point of view, it's supposed to be a ceiling that you don't right. print more money than that because that's the ceiling. So can we like make a realistic debt ceiling of like 1.4 quadrillion? Just say we're going to get there eventually. We, we can survive this amount. We're going to print another $7,000 trillion because um, I think we are going to. I, I don't know. Do you think maybe we won't? Um, do you, what do you think about that idea? Is that just too far out? What are you, what are you in? Well, you're, you're right that it's, it's a joke because there is no real plan to ensure that we have a cap on that which we will borrow and spend. And I think the reason this continues to get worse on the books is because like regular Americans don't feel the pain of the national debt in approximate way. Like if an illegal immigrant, you know, runs over your family member, you feel that, right? If you know, you, uh, someone in your household loses their job. There's a direct impact you see if the factory that your mom worked at goes to, you know, Chihuahua, Mexico, mm -hmm. that is a traceable thing. But yeah. so long as we're the global reserve currency, we're able to sort of um, exist in this era of expanding debt. Now, we're starting to pay the price with rising inflation. But, you know, the, there is no real lobby or special interest for less spending in Washington. Like that's the problem. Go on K Street, throw a rock, and you're going to hit someone who's paid a lot of money to get more spending in one way or the other. And so like the way we compromise is just by doing all of it, <laughs> whether it's defense, non-defense, discretionary, non-discretionary, mandatory. And that is how like the uniparty works. So th the demand we put with the leverage we had in the speaker's race was that the House of Representatives must pass 
a budget resolution at the 2022 spending levels. So roll this thing back a couple years. And it's similar to like in 2015 when they did cut cap and balance. And so here, all of what we do has to go under those spending levels. And look, it's going to mean some cuts in areas that I support, like defense. But if we've got to cut defense, maybe we ought to cut all the money we spend defending other nations far away, yeah. like Ukraine. Hey, mm -hmm. hey, Pakistan needs their gender studies, okay? I think oh, it's yes. imperative yes. for the world Where would that we, we finance as that, as well as, you know, a Beagle torture by Dr. Fauci. We need to finance <laughs> that. Who else is going to do it unless we do it? So uh, I'm, 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 just, I'm just being facetious here. But obviously, there's a lot of wheel and, and dealing in Washington, D.C., and we saw that through, of course, this larger uh, vote for the Speaker of the House. Uh, you saw a lot of it. We saw a lot of people like MTG, also a lot of individuals like Thomas Macy, not really kind of join your cause there are you able to speak about some of the deals that were being made there and what was being negotiated behind the scenes because we know publicly there was a lot said but there's also a lot of closed door meetings that we didn't get to see are you able to to talk about those sure i mean thomas massey while he voted for mccarthy on every ballot he was there with us in the back rooms helping write the, a lot of the fiscal policy that ended up undergirding the agreement and mtg you know, she is an inspirational force. I consider her probably my closest ally in all of Congress, and she uh, deserves to be on committees. And what the Democrats did to her was so wrong and so egregious. And I think that she had an earlier understanding with Speaker McCarthy that she would get back on committees, that they would be meaningful committees, that they would tailor to her skill set. And I think that was sufficient for her to support him. We sought some broader structural changes. We achieved those. Uh, pr the changes and concessions we got out of McCarthy are only going to inure to the benefit of MTG because she's one of our more dynamic and fearless members. I like uh, Kevin's behavior the last week. McCarthy. Uh, something oh, yeah. How would you rate his, yeah, uh, look, his him being Speaker of the House this week? Well, one of the things that was not in the rules but was part of our addendum agreement was that the 14,000 hours had to be released of the footage from January 6th. And the Speaker has custodial oversight of a lot of those records. And he made that commitment. And then today he reaffirmed it publicly that that's exactly wow. what we're going to do. So, yeah, that, you know, trust is a series of promises kept. And I believe that McCarthy deserves the opportunity to keep the promises he made. And so far, he's on the right track. Is he going to have a grudge against you? I, mean, I don't know that I'm going to be on his Christmas card list, but, it, you know, it doesn't <laughs> it, like that. That's not really what it's about. You know, he knows very clearly what my objectives are and what it took to get us to go forward with a speaker. And he is performing to that expectation. It's, you know, it's, it's not personal for me. It's, it's business. I'd love to get you guys in together to debate oh, live on the show. It'd be hot. <laughs> well, I mean, what, what, what would the, the, the best outcome of that have been? Jim Jordan or, or Byron Donalds? Look, I, I think that Jim Jordan is our most talented member. I think he's our hardest working member. He is one of my mentors. He inspires me. But, you know, it got to a point where there were six holdouts where you don't, we didn't want to drive McCarthy into the arms of the Democrats, right? So once the margin gets that low, McCarthy could, in theory, have gone to the Democrats, gotten, you know, four or five, six of them to yeah. get instant COVID in exchange for draining our subpoena authority. And then he would have ascended to the speakership anyway. All of the features of our deal would have dissolved. And then every time we didn't send a subpoena to hold government accountable, he could have said, well, that's Matt Gates's fault. So we didn't want to put him in that position, the country in that position, the House in that position. And so that's why we crafted what we thought was the a, a deal that was not reliant on trust, but that had clear enforcement triggers. Eric Swalwell, Adam Schiff, they're getting removed from their committees, right? Yeah. Do you think that's a good thing? Yeah, I think that the Democrats kind of, you know, crossed the Rubicon on this when they threw MTG and Gosar off committees without a basis. And there is sufficient basis with Schiff in particular. Oh, I agree. And, uh, you know, Swalwell now, I don't think this, that like the grave Swalwell emergency is the Fang Fang thing. I think it's more the role he played in the Russia hoax. Like when you go out there and say there's evidence that the president of the United States is a Russian agent and then you don't deliver on that, mm -hmm. you shouldn't get to serve on the major committees yeah. that have access to the most sensitive intelligence on the planet Earth. I agree. <clears throat> and Adam Schiff. But like the Fang Fang thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll, Poor Fang Fang. Listen, listen, the, the, the Internet is not going to like what I have to say. 
Maybe. But within the Republican conference, I am Swalwell's biggest defender on the Fang Fang thing. And here is why. He was a city councilman in the city of Dublin. And some chick showed up with money wanting to hook up with him. You think that, like, he's a single guy, like, running around Southern or running around California. And, and he's supposed to have, like, the defensive briefing to turn down some, like, hot Chinese chick, chick that was wanting to, like, donate money and jump in bed with him. He wasn't a member of Congress. He didn't have access to intelligence. The What most sensitive information he was working on was, like, the sewage system of the city of Dublin. So I think you, you probably give the guy a break for that. What you don't give him a break for is then coming here and weaving these whole lies onto half truths to try to destabilize the presidency in the country. That's far more egregious than the Fang Fang thing. Was he with Fang Fang while he was in Congress? No, that was when he was on the city council somewhere in nowhere, California. Oh, but there's also with Adam Schiff, the release of phone records of private citizens and Nunes. Which yeah, is oh yeah. Well, Schiff, Schiff is truly the worst member of Congress. He is, he, I mean, he is, uh, it's like looking into the eyes of evil with that guy. He's really I was just gonna say, guy. I think he's an evil man. Yeah, and he I'm, has no reflection. <laughs> what is going on? The and if you bring garlic around, his like skin starts to burn. I haven't talked to him, but I think he's got that same mindset that he's like, these people are evil. And then other people are like, he's evil. Like what is going on? No is way, it just dude. A, a breakdown he, in communication did, or something? He, he held up an envelope on TV saying that it was proof Trump colluded with Russia or whatever and that he couldn't show anybody. That, like, that's what happened. I'm, it's been a while. Yeah, Something well, like and that. then he, like, made up a a construct of a transcript between Zelensky and Trump that just didn't happen. It was just willed into existence by his imagination. And, I mean, he's done such damage to our intelligence community. And, like, there is a place for the United States to like know what's going on in the world. Usually knowledge is power, right? But the way he weaponized it and it really started with a lot of the Obama people like the say what you will about Obama. The guy was good at vertically integrating personnel in a, in a lot of these agencies where where the bureaucracy would bend to their will. Like if there's a fair critique of Trump, it's that, you know, he was this great visionary, but oftentimes the people that were two, three, four layers down were working against him. And he didn't roll into the presidency with this terrific Rolodex of people that could go and operate at that level. Whereas, you know, Schiff, Obama, like these, these people were good at getting people in place to drive action. And we should learn from that. Is it because they were hooked up with the liberal economic order at the time and like they just had all the backing of... Right. There's a whole infrastructure. Like if you're part of the prevailing way of thinking, the national security state, the neoconservative worldview, there's an entire infrastructure there to like build out your career. There are endowed professor professorships. There are think tanks that are ready to give you six figure jobs. There's a like career progression of jobs on the hill. But if you think differently, you're kind of hunted in a lot. You know, you're hunted, canceled. They do everything to compromise you. And if that doesn't work, they try to destroy you. What do you, so there's a lot of compromise, um, especially in Washington D.C. But but how deep does the rabbit hole goal be, go? Because there's a lot of people talking about you know the deep state, the intelligence agencies having a lot of control, using a lot of extortion, special interest interest groups pulling the strings here. What's your understanding of how things really work in Washington D.C. compared to what the average American kind of sees? Well, I think that, like the most corrupt, like foray into this is like freshman orientation because like you show up here and I mean you know imagine showing up from northwest Arkansas from like you know southern Mississippi and you see the architecture of DC they take you out to like the finest steakhouse the best wine you've ever had and co-located at your table are the lobbyists for the major special interests for the committees that you're interested that you want to wow. serve on so like I get here and they're like oh Gates you want to be on the armed services committee have you met these defense contractors <laughs> these are the key lobbyists that round up the defense money and they put you with them from the very beginning and you sort of get the joke that if you give your vote card to the leadership and your calendar to the lobby corps you just kind of get enveloped into a system that's there to nurture you and protect you and keep you out of harm's way and all it costs you is your own belief set and I don't think that's compromise so much as selling out now you know that, so that is like step one and that catches a, a whole lot of the people who get here and then beyond that if you kind of resist that system then they do try to extort you uh, engage in anything they can do to compromise you cancel you 
find some joke that you liked on Instagram years ago that like doesn't fit with the mores of this time. Find some email that you were on like the forward chain of that's like some basis to say that you're a white supremacist or you're, you know, some sort of uh, unacceptable human that can't be in polite company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then if that doesn't work, it, it's abject destruction through the political process where there are many, many dollars lined up solely for the extermination of those who push back against against the narrative. Yeah, this is detailed extensively in books like the, the Economic Hitman that I think are definitely worth reading and checking out here. But talking to previous members of Congress, it, it's really kind of daunting to see what they have to go through, how much pressure they have to go through, how much agreement they have to uh, agree to before even getting into some of those positions of power. Um, well, in the dues, it's yeah. money. I mean, it's yeah. th there's specific dollar amounts. I mean, I remember, you know, going in and saying, well, I, I want to be on the Armed Services Committee. And someone looked me dead in the eye and said, well, that'll be $75,000 that you owe to the leadership funds and, and to the Republican Congressional Committee. Wow. And so, you know, I, I go home and think, well, you know, part of you wants to say, screw you, or like, are you wearing a wire? Yeah, if, if, I, could ask, <laughs> if I could ask you, and, and again, you don't have to answer this, but who do you think is more influential and powerful in Washington, D.C., the lobbyists or the intelligence agencies? Well, I mean, the answer to the question is yes, they're one and the same, because 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 <laughs> yeah. often oftentimes they are fused with precisely the same personnel, where people will roll out of DOJ and end up at you know the law firm that services the lobby corps and and the very same clients. I mean, there's no better example of the fusion of that than when I learned through a whistleblower that the the Perkins Coie law firm, which is the legal wing of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Party has within it a secure information facility that is run by the FBI. So they, they literally have a place in their law firm where they can try to convert political dirt into intelligence investigations, counterintelligence investigations, criminal investigations, and the like. Yeah, and let's not forget all the Epstein and tapes. And it's up and that running today. Too. Yeah, it's yeah. up and running today. And they have all the Epstein tapes too, but that's another thing. Do you have any hope in the Jim Jordan uh, new committee when it comes to investigating the weaponization of government? Do you think that's going to be akin to maybe a church committee? Yeah, that, that's our objective. And the specific agreement we have with McCarthy is that that select committee will have the budget resources, personnel, no less than the Democrats, <laughs> January 6th committee. Well, what do you think? Do you think it'll work out? Uh, look, it's hard to promise outcomes when we don't have the ability to throw handcuffs on anybody or put anybody in jail, right? All we can do is expose facts. And so it relies on other features of our system to kind of go end to end on that accountability. And so I don't want to promise people like, yeah, you know, you're going to see Hunter Biden hauled off in cuffs. You're going to see the Joe Biden University of Penn, like China money laundering stuff. And, you know, because that may be out there, but it may not result in precisely what people would hope upon upon encountering the information. Ian, do you want to ask about, you made that point about sometimes no investigation is better than an investigation. Oh, yeah, especially like with the NIST investigation for 9-11. I mean, there's so many holes in that thing if you look at it objectively. Well, like, I'm concerned that they would put forth an investigation, but it ends up being a sham. And then they're like, okay, we did it. Our investigation's over, everyone. We didn't find anything. Don't ask again, as well, opposed to no investigation. And then This is the Saudis' playbook, right? I mean, you know, the Saudis were able to avoid the responsibility uh, that they have in the 9-11 attacks and in a terrorist attack in my district in Pensacola because they get a nice little report written that, you know, is sufficient to absolve them. And then they say, oh, well, not like not nothing to see here. You don't need to come back and conduct any further inquiry. Do you fear or, or is that concern when when creating committees of I don't know, because I'm like, well, we need an independent committee, but who's deciding who's on the independent committee? Like, how do you ensure that it isn't a sham? Personnel. I mean, that that's why we know that the people who will be on that committee will be people like Jim Jordan, Chip Roy, Thomas Massey, people who actually ask tough questions. What is the point? What is the goal exactly? Like, are there specific um, directions that you guys are aiming at thus far? Have you decided like what, what I don't know, departments are going to be investigated or what is, are specific things being looked for? <laughs> yeah, you heard McCarthy in his uh, speech single out the FBI, right? He did not talk about like a weaponized government in the abstract. When he spoke, he spoke specifically about politics at the FBI. So one of our first areas of inquiry is going to be 
this Timothy Tebalt guy who suppressed information that was derogatory to the Bidens and did not allow the normal process of criminal inquiry to continue there. And, and they do everything they can at the FBI to try to supercharge anything that is related to Trump or anyone around Trump or anybody who's on the right. And then if it's the Bidens, they, they function as um, their defender and they suppress the derogatory information. So that'd probably be where we start. I, I wonder how it is that, you know, Trump being a wealthy <clears throat> elite and all that stuff still ends up outside the big club that, you know, Joe Biden seems to get away with everything, but Donald Trump is the target of everything. Do you think that it's it's a function of elitism or do you think it's a function of, uh, of like Joe, Joe Biden just being of the system, right? I mean, he's all, he is of this place. Uh, he chaired, you know, foreign affairs in the Senate where you interact with a lot of the people who end up in powerful positions in the intelligence community. And Trump went in with a goal of reorganizing that and, and changing it and that's, I think, why they kick back at him so hard. What I don't understand, though, is if Trump or let's say Joe Biden is part of the liberal economic order that's, you know, we're evolving to a new world order. They say George Bush Sr. said that. Klaus Schwab's intimated that. Lots of people around the world are realizing we're globalizing. A new world order where it's not about American military bases everywhere anymore. Now we're going to have a new type of thing. But in that instance, I would think that the Americans would want the Russians on their side, not siding with China and the Chinese economic order. I don't understand why... Why are people pushing Russia away if they're trying to create a new world? It's going to make Amer I'm concerned it would make America number three. Well, I mean, what we're seeing right now is the leverage buyout of Russia from uh, with a lot of Chinese cash. I mean, there there are more Chinese with two million dollars cash in their bank account right now, like U.S. US uh, equivalent, than there are total Canadians. And so, wow. you know, yeah, you're you're seeing uh, a lot of the farmland. You know, in Russia, uh, get just bought out by the Chinese, and it it, it fuses it's, it's here, though, those it? systems in a way that poses a real substantial threat to the United States, to the West at large. Aren't they buying our farmland as well? Yeah, I thought that <laughs> maybe being colonized. Maybe we could propose some sort of peace deal between Russia and Ukraine because the what they're doing it looks like Putin's trying to take a land bridge to Crimea so that he has warm water access into the Black Sea. Russia, basically after the Soviet Union split up, they, they took it all away from Russia and they gave, um, they gave it to, to Ukraine. That city, what's the big city there right on the, right on the, in Crimea? And I think what, what, what we need to do is establish, I don't think Russia's ever going to stop until they get a land bridge into Crimea and a warm water seaport. So has that come up in Congress that you guys are like, can we I've got a pretty a cynical view on the, you know, Russia-Ukraine conflict. Yeah. I, uh, I've been voting against sending more weapons there. Hold on. Let me get this cough drop. In yeah, there. dog. I'll give you guys a... Well, the geopolitical situation, uh, especially between... <laughs> you got an extra one of those? ...that's happening right now. And you get, yeah, a lot of people <laughs> in the comment section are saying that this is cough cast. It's cough cast. Uh, unfolding right now. I think I'm the only one. Well, I'm not coughing. I just lost my voice. Me and Ian are the only ones holding, holding on here. But it is a very complex uh, geopolitical situation that I think represents the larger proxy war between the East and the West. Um, I, I think sending in more weapons prolongs this proxy conflict to make sure that, of course, it goes on forever. I think this war is meant to be continued and not won. There's also a lot of debates now about tanks. Uh, to me, do you think there's a possibility for any kind of peace deal? Because I think it's getting... Um, co-opted so many times, including by individuals like Boris Johnson that literally go to Ukraine and say, no, you're not going to even sit at the table here with the Russians. Do you think one year from now, 10 years from now, there's some kind of possibility for peace here? Or is this just going to be a Well, who makes money on a forever? peace deal? That's true. Yep. Right? I mean, peace is not nearly as profitable to those who are in the war business. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, so obviously I have to say it out loud. I mean, to me, our involvement in Ukraine is directly linked to our diminished involvement in Afghanistan. Like Afghanistan was the money laundering capital of the world for like a lot of our lifetime. A lot of that cash was like run through Dubai and, you know, Abu Dhabi. And when that was not the corrupt country that we just decided to pour American cash on. Like we needed another historically corrupt country to go pour American military material and cash into. And, and gain and, a function and, research and, too. And UK, Ukraine fit the bill. And so I don't believe that like anyone's really working toward peace. I think that there are 
very powerful interests that benefit if this is a long-term, low-yield war. Yes, yeah, C- CNN but- is even reporting right now that the United States is running low on some weapons and ammunition because they're transferring so much of it to Ukraine right now. So that's that's staggering and also dangerous for the United States to be in such a vulnerable spot as well. So uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of bigger interest here. BlackRock just signed a deal with Ukraine that they're going to be rebuilding Ukraine as, of course, BlackRock also has a lot of deals funding uh, and being a part of the military industrial complex. There, you see the circle of life they're kind of involving there. Is there any way to kind of address this? Is there anything that we could do as people to bring awareness to this? Is there any way there could be some kind of peace here? Well, the trend lines are coming in my direction when it comes to public perception on this. I mean, initially, like the American people were dying to send every American dollar, you know, to Ukraine. And increasingly, at least within the Republican Party, you've started to see that shift as our economic conditions are more in the forefront of people's minds. Like, we have laws that require end-to-end monitoring of materiel when we send it into a war zone, and I am not convinced we are following them. Is it because we're not technically at war? The United States hasn't been technically at a war since World War II. Well, in a we do have regs that define a conflict zone, and whenever we send stuff that kills into one of those places, we're supposed to know who has it, and we don't. And that is concerning to me. If that's like the new thing is like, oh, well, you know, send the stuff, anything. What was it that Ben Sass said when he was in the Senate? If it shoots, send it. And so we've been doing all of that. And I think that in some ways prolongs conflict. It doesn't bring us to a faster resolution to continue to pour cash and weapons into a historically corrupt country that is fighting. Yeah, Dave Smith would say and has said, if you want to see who our next big enemy is going to be, look at who we're funding right now. And I'm concerned that the the Nazis, I don't know if they're, technically are they considered Nazis? Let's be, uh, what is it? Well, Democrats thought so. I mean, you, you had you had uh, uh, dozens of Democrats signing letters saying that the Azov Battalion were a bunch of white supremacists. And while they want to call our own military, who are patriots, a bunch of white supremacists here, they got no problem draining the resources of our country to go and fund who they were just calling white supremacists, you know, like 18 a couple months years ago. ago. So yeah. if in six years the Azovs start exterminating a race because they are happen to be genocidal or racist, like then what is the American, are you going to use that as evidence to go to war in Ukraine to fight the Azov? And now we got more military bases in Ukraine protecting the Suez Canal? Yep. Well, there's a lot of intel reports of a lot of uh, advanced U.S. military hardware being sold on the black markets as well. And a lot of the weapons, even according to CBS News and aid, not making it to its official destination. And I think that's 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 such a travesty because there's so much human suffering in that country. There's so many people use this pawn. There's so many people hurt with this larger conflict. There's such a bigger immigration crisis here. How do you see all of this going? Because you have a lot of, you know, uh, you're in Congress. You talk to a lot of people there. How do you see this kind of unfolding here with this never-ending war? Where, where, where are we going to be uh, a couple years from now with this continuing the way it is? What worries me is like th- you cannot overstate the gravity of some of the worst potential outcome sets here. I mean, you know, Russia, much like a Bond villain, sort of becomes more and more dangerous during its demise. It's, it's a kleptocracy in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of people have gotten out of Russia with whatever they could steal on their way out right? To your point about the materiel and the black market. And so I think that for us to go and like play a game of nuclear chicken over which guy in a track suit gets to run Crimea (laughs) is foolish. And it's not, it's not how serious a serious country ought to behave. You think world war three could result from recklessness? Of course, of, of course, this is a tinderbox and it's not Syria, right? It's Russia and Ukraine. It is a country that has enough nuclear power to end Earth multiple times over. And it's a leader who I don't think is making stable, rational decisions in Vladimir Putin. And, you know, to continue to send the HIMARS there, to send the Bradleys there from the United States uh, seems provocative to me. Now, why isn't this Europe's problem, right? You would think that Germany and the other powers in Europe would have the most at stake. But what they do, you know, as these European democracies face elections and as their reserves go down, like you're going to see them have a different posture towards Russia as their mandates expire and as they have to go back for elections. Plus, they rely on us for defense. Right. Well, I mean, we're that was one of the principal critiques that Trump made that I think got a lot of disaffected people to support him is when he said, I'm just tired of being like dead money at the world stage, like being the world's policeman, being the world's 
piggy bank has not been good for the American middle class. Yeah, Trump also uh, made sure that he sent lethal weapons to Ukraine, something Obama was even afraid to do. So, I mean, this conflict has been brewing for so long, since 2014, even before that, with their kind of revolution that's happening there. But it's uh, to me, this is just uh, such, such, such a sad thing to see humanity go through. Um, but... Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I just I just hope this kind of ends somehow. I don't think it is. Well, I don't know if like, we should potentially even change topics. What, what do you think yeah, when yeah. you see your leaders in Congress wear the like American flag, Ukraine flag, like pin around? Wasn't McCarthy doing that? Yep. I, I, think I, so. I saw a photo. I don't know if it was it, real or not. It seems like they don't understand that Russia needs a warm water or wants a warm water port in the Black Sea. Like if that if that was understood, and it's like, yo, this is about trade. This is about Russia. Yeah, getting, you, you think it's just a real estate play? Yeah, I think he day. takes that energy. Gazprom, natural gas, et cetera. It's real estate. Yeah, I think it is 100% real estate. And I don't know why there's not more American English media of Putin talking. Well, real estate, but energy, right? So Yeah, transportation of Gazprom oil. Gazprom controls a large portion of the natural gas from Russia into, into Europe. The Western powers want to control to it. to the Suez Canal, which is all right. of the Indian Ocean and things like that. Put some weights on Russia. Russia doesn't like it. Russia says, we're going to go and take the port back. War. So that's what I think is that they're missing it, that they just don't, that they're emotionally... Uh, blockade their, their their perception is being blockaded by emotions because it's always horrible to see someone get killed or to see a house get blown up or invasion or any of that. I, it's horrible, you know. I, yeah, I kind I'm of, against war. You know, I mean, I I think that it's one of the reasons why I'm a little more dovish in my views. I I think oftentimes both sides lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder if like you know the World Economic Forum Davos group types have um, substantial influence when it comes to the wars we declare. Have you been uh, well, asked? Yeah. Why, uh, is that an open question in your mind? No, I think they do. Like, of course. What, what I mean is to what degree, right? Because obviously the goals they have, the actions we take align with them. So it's, it's like the U.S. has no reason to be involved in Ukraine. Like you said, it's Europe's problem. Yet for some reason, we're acting like one body. Yeah, we're the, we're the military arm of the liberal economic order, the exactly. British Empire, basically. Ha have you been asked? To that be turned out well. Yeah. <laughs> have you been asked to be a part of the World Economic Forum? And what kind of influence do you think they kind of have on uh, the United States since Klaus Schwab openly brags about how he has half of the Canadian parliament being young members of the World Economic Forum? Yeah, no, I, I think that, that it's part of the like political industrial complex. It's the finance wing of the political industrial complex. And so like if what you need to keep your power and to win your elections is a super PAC that shows up with, you know, $10 million in dark money, like who do you think cuts those checks? You think it's like some guy who's like a furniture tycoon in Oklahoma? It's not. Bank for International Settlements. And everybody in knows it. And everybody knows. And like, you know, this is an area where the populist right and the populist left need to work together on the way that we fund campaigns in this country, because it, it like it always works to the benefit of the uniparty. And I don't get why people should be able to put unlimited money without disclosure into manipulating the viewpoints of Americans. Do you think politically there's going to be some kind of rift and change here? Because there does seem to be, obviously, the, the Democrats and the Republicans, but there also seems to be a, a, a bigger rift amongst the establishment and the anti-establishment. Totally. Uh, there's a lot of populists. There's also a lot of statists. There's a lot of rhinos. There's a lot of neocons. It's like a civil war within a civil war within a civil war, politically speaking, not violently speaking. Um, do, you, do you see the political landscape changing in the future? Because uh, I think a lot of people are sick of these neocons, of these kind of rhinos, and they don't really represent the American people. We had enough of George W. Bush. He had his time. He ruined that time. And I think he spurred a, 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 you know, a situation where now the Democrats have a lot of power. You know, when I first got elected to Congress, we could have a lot of collaboration between the populist right and the populist left on things like war powers, the surveillance state. Um, political reforms that don't just empower kind of the PAC structure. And then January 6 happened. And like those populist leftists like would not talk to us. I mean, would not collaborate with us on bills, would not engage in any way. And it became so, it became such a point of personal trauma for some of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that was good for the country. I don't think that was good for kind of the anti-establishment unity that we need. I will say that like since Republicans took the majority. They've uh, they've been a lot nicer to us, dude. But we, we, we saw you uh, talking with AOC during this whole process, right? Was that was that something relevant or that you can share? Sure. I mean, I, and I I got caught 
on camera in conversations with AOC, Ilhan Omar, and Pramila Jayapal, like three people who folks have seen me disagree with more than agree with. With AOC, I was discussing whether or not the Democrats were going to leave the floor and cut a deal with McCarthy because that would have changed the math wow. on the speaker vote. And so she was actually doing everything possible to make sure that they didn't and that there were wow. 212 Democrats voting for Jeffries on every ballot. Wow. Um, with Jayapal, we've worked together on legislation to break up big tech. And I was talking to her about the prospects in a Republican Congress and a Republican House of getting some bipartisan, bicameral solutions to reshape a lot of these companies. And the Jayapal legislation from the 117th Congress like, was not you know, taking immunities away and all that. It said, no, like, Meta has to alienate their Instagram asset. Google has to alienate email from search and like literally breaking up these companies. And then with Omar, we were actually talking about war powers. And wow, I was I was teasing her a bit. Like I was like, you guys like showed up here and said the military was racist. And like before <laughs> before you were done being in the majority, you were like voting for NATO. Like yeah, you know yeah. what 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 went th what went on there? And so I was a uh, I was uh, teasing her a bit. Well, about what that. did go on there? Hypocrisy, you know, tribalism. I think that they. Um, they got drafted into that establishment Democrat thinking. Yeah, I don't think that the squad really believes that like NATO is advancing the interests of their constituents on a day in day out basis. But yet they were still willing to vote for all these like NATO strengthening endeavors. Are, well, there's oh, go ahead. Are, are there some issues that could bridge the the kind of populist left and the populist right together? Are there some things that we could actually agree upon that could bring this country back together? The first thing that comes to mind personally is the Epstein scandal. I think everyone on the left and right agrees on that. But are there some issues that you think could, uh, could you guys could work How about together abolishing on? FISA, right? I mean, why wouldn't the populist right and populist left agree to take down some elements of the surveillance state? Yeah, I I absolutely. absolutely you know. Another idea would be cleaning up the environment, like the atmosphere, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. You can convert it into graphene. Are you? Oh, here we go. Everyone yeah. drink <laughs> directly. No, I, no, I'm all about the carbon capture stuff. And also, this is a part of like the libertarian thing that I don't get. Like, why would we, as Americans, give carte blanche to a bunch of powerful businesses to pollute our air and our water? Uh, to me, America first means that you actually have to want this to be a beautiful place. And and so. I do think that like making sure that we don't completely sell out to people to to trash our nation, you know, would would be important. Regarding using um, the government to protect us from corporations, I, you were talking about breaking up big tech earlier. Yeah. I think a mistake that we should not make is what they did to Rockefeller with his Standard Oil. They broke it up into like seven or eight oil companies, and then he made more money off of these new. So like breaking up Facebook into Facebook Prime, Facebook Messenger, Instagram as different companies, Mark would still have the code. He'd still be able to run software like that. So I'm thinking we need to make them free their software code so that other people can spin up versions of those websites, interlock them. My version of Facebook can interoperate with your, with Mark Zuckerberg's mm -hmm. version. And that Decentralization, was, I think. But well, yeah, the interoperability of data is really what you're what you're talking yes, about. Yes, force the companies, but, and it's sort of like um, sort of like breaking up monopoly, but we're not actually breaking the company apart. But where I disagree is giving your proprietary code up is basically you, it's your your ownership of your your intellectual property, but releasing the algorithmic code, yeah. how they manipulate the public with algorithms, I think is extremely important. I think that's the path for big set uh, big tech to heal the system with big tech, as opposed to just try and smash up companies and make them do what the government says they have to do. Like, let them ban whoever they want. But if they're not, if they have bad terms of service and your version of the site has better terms of service, they're gonna lose well, users. Well, I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I got, I got a different question, so. No, I don't know about you, but I think uh, big tech had a huge influence in this latest midterm election. I think they're also uh, essentially controlling what a lot of people see and think with their algorithms. They're becoming a, a huge, powerful entity that, of course, also now we're finding out through, through the Twitter files work for the private intelligence agencies. That curation, that ability to, to control what people see and listen to, that's a huge power. I personally think it had an effect on the election, and I think it's going to continue to have bigger effects on the election, especially in places that took a lot of the Zuckerbucks. Florida was one of the states that refused money from Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, and their elections went totally different than a lot of states that did. Is there a solution to this? Is there a way to kind of rein in these intelligence agencies that are controlling big tech that are essentially asserting their will on everyone else? I think that on the election front, the specific algorithmic work to target 
certain types of voters to push registration, to push vote by mail, to push early voting, to do election day awareness. Like that is that is partisan based on who they are trying to target those messages to, right? And that should be transparent. And if it was transparent, I actually think the right enforcement tool is the Federal Elections Commission because, you know, when a when Facebook says, okay, well, like, we're going to target this exact population of people with this age range and this zip code, that is a donation to a political party and a political movement and should be subject to the same caps that any other American would be subject to. Now, I got a question for the audience. DeSantis Gates 2024? <laughs> I'm for Trump. You're uh, for Trump? Yeah, I'm for Trump. Uh, I, I think the world of DeSantis. I Trump Gates 2024. Well, uh, I would do anything the president asked, but I think he's got better choices. Uh, I like what I'm, what I'm doing now. You know, I was very involved in DeSantis' first campaign. I was his transition chairman when he came into the governorship in Florida. I helped him hire a lot of the folks that shaped the policy that make Florida the envy of the country right now. Uh, I think Ron DeSantis will be president one day, but in 2024, it's uh, my hope and expectation will be Donald Trump. What, what do you think about Donald Trump still telling everyone to get vaccinated? That's been one of the core issues that kind of been uh, a, a big kind of uh, shock to a lot of people, especially a lot of his Dude, the people. the boomers love the vax. Yeah, I mean, I mean, right now with the FDA and, and what CDC. What was the Saturday Night Live thing where it was like the boomers love the vax? They, they uh, uh, if they're still around. But uh, the, the FDA and CDC just came out and said that they're going to be investigating possible very serious side effects. That's an issue oh, that oh. is concerning uh, to a lot of people, especially a lot of Trump supporters. Well, let's, let's, let's pull this up, actually. We have this from Politico. CDC, FDA see possible link between Pfizer's bivalent shot and strokes. The agency said the surveillance signal is very unlikely to represent a true clinical risk and said they will continue to recommend the vaccine. So this obviously has a lot of people worried. You knew what the tell was. It was when the number one thing Republicans were lobbying for was were immunity protections and liability protections for the vaccine <laughs> yeah. manufacturers. I mean, you knew at the very beginning this was going to be an issue because they had to they had to lay out all of their immunities and protections. And because YouTube was censoring anybody who brought that up. How are you still on YouTube? Like, you know, my thread, I'm telling yeah. you, man. we argue with each other. Like if I say anything about COVID for the most part, Tim will be like, no, no, no. And then we'll like go at it. And we never make definitive claims. Very, very well, rarely make definitive claims about things we don't have proof. Of. It's, it's basically just like, look, we're reading Politico here. You know what I mean? Hey, man, if YouTube's got a problem with Politico, the BBC, CNN, all reporting this. Well, then we're all asked. Well, I mean, Mar yeah, this Marjorie is, this Taylor Greene got got zapped off of social media for saying that if you were really overweight, that was probably a bad idea vis-a-vis -vis COVID and exercise would be helpful. And then, you you know, lo and behold, you later see yeah. CNN and the CDC d uh, Crowder, accept those positions. Crowder, uh, Stephen Crowder got a strike for citing the CDC. Yeah, it's but but today's pretty big, especially with this FDA CDC news that uh, almost everyone in the corporate media is talking about. The British broadcasting company even had a cardiologist on that they're getting criticized for having on a doctor, a mainline professional that was talking about the larger concerns when it came to this, of course, shot and larger health effects that are being correlated here. I know Florida is investigating that right now under Ron DeSantis, but I see this as Joe being, uh, uh, yeah, but I see this as being a very key divisive issue, especially when it comes to the. Republican primaries, especially when it comes to the possibility of DeSantis and Trump kind of heading, uh, going at each other. How do you see that larger battle unfolding? And do you think there's going to be any accountability uh, against Big Pharma for a lot of their kind of egregious actions and a lot of their data that they're hiding from the American people? No. I mean, there are multiple Big Pharma lobbyists for every single member of Congress. You want to talk about a special interest that has a death grip on the political process. It is Big Pharma. And I don't know that the vax mandate in the 2024 primaries will still be like at the top of the issue matrix. I, I think this economy is about to go through a serious contraction. Yeah. I think that people are going to see their 401ks uh, experience real problems. I think that as interest rates rise and we that has such an impact on our nation's debt service mm -hmm. uh, and, and how far the dollar can go purchasing power, business confidence, consumer confidence. I think like that's going to be the issue matrix along with the border uh, in 2024. And, and a lot of places are getting rid of the vax mandate. I mean, I'm grateful that the Department of Defense is ditching the vax mandate. Yeah. The fight's not over. We got to reinstate people who saw their lives ruined. But I don't see it being a big. Yeah, you still we, need we, a vaccine to enter the United States if you're not yeah. a citizen. You need one to go. To, so tomorrow I'm on CNN. I'm on uh, Smirconish's show. So I was going to come into the studio, do the shtick there. And they're like, 
produce your vaccine, your wow. booster? No uh, were you triple boosted? Did you get a booster this morning? Do you have a negative test? And I'm like, I'm not doing any of that stuff. So I've got to shoot the the segment remote. But then every time I see like my Republican colleagues now on set in the studio, I'm like, ah. you know, we we had on the Krasensteins the other day. They're Democrats. And I asked them if they thought the economy was good, fairly good, bad, and they said somewhere between fairly bad and fairly good. And if you look at the polling, m the majority, the plurality of people at the majority think it's fairly bad or worse. 40% yeah. say very bad. Mm -hmm. So we got the story about Joe Biden and the documents in his garage. Meanwhile, it's like $9 in some places for a carton of eggs. You know, milk is, is really expensive. I think the average person, when it comes to the issue matrix, like you're mentioning, is just sitting there wondering why cabbage costs $7. Yeah, I mean, I looked at the little head of cauliflower that we got at the grocery store, like the shrinkflation is real as well. And we were talking before we went live just about how silly I think like the archivist disputes are. Like I said in September, probably every one of these presidential, vice presidential libraries and think tanks in America is out of some sort of technical compliance with the Records Keeping yeah. Act. And for my constituents who have to drive a long way to work and are looking at gas prices, who if you want to buy a used car today, I mean, good luck. I mean, it's, I don't know if you want to drive them or bronze them after you get them based on how much you have to pay. The housing market, rent being up uh, yeah, so crazy. high. I mean, already we made it where millennials can barely afford to, to buy a house. So, so many are forced into rental life. And now what's happening with the cost of rent? You know, those are things that I think like people really think about and you turn on cable news and it's all about like there's an 11th document that they have found <laughs> in joe biden's convertibles glove compartment yeah. and we're supposed to clutch our pearls and act like that's like the <laughs> biggest thing on the planet earth the 1.7 trillion omnibus that went through a couple was a month ago three weeks ago that changed the value of the dollar doing the math 1.7 trillion to our 31 trillion deficit is uh, or debt is uh took the value of the dollar from one dollar to 95 cents like every dollar that you have is now worth 95 cents because that bill passed or be, that, yeah, yes, was, yes. that money was printed, I should say. Yeah. And you can go, you know, recap the value if you go to the gender studies courses in Pakistan. <laughs> exactly. And I think the financial problem is going to be very significant. I, I think a lot of people saw it uh, during the beginning of COVID. Uh, I personally was calling it out, but but we still haven't seen the full ramifications of it. There's there's going to be a lot of responsibility when it comes to printing so much money, spending so much money that we don't have. What are you seeing down the pipeline? How do you think this is going to unfold? Some people are saying uh, in the corporate media, that this is going to be just a little temporary recession. I don't think so myself. No How do you see it unfolding? Yeah, it just it, it seems as though we haven't yet paid the full price in jobs for what we've done to the dollar. And you're mm -hmm. starting to see that with, you know, all the what I call the hoodie layoffs, right? All the tech companies laying off people by the thousands. But now we're starting to see it in the productive sectors of the economy, too, in manufacturing, in agriculture. Um, stuff's just not creating the same investment confidence it's not attracting the same degree of capital now mm -hmm. fortunately a lot of other places in the world are ha have it worse than we do so the dollar you know has not has not bottomed out but we cannot drive government spending to this extent and so then it becomes like okay in this world of divided government what fight do you pick to try to resolve that and we got the debt limit coming up and republicans typically lose fights over the debt limit if you just look politically, historically, because you know we're talking about some sort of economic algebra problem, and the Democrats are like, yeah, well, your 401k will get cut in half, you know, if this doesn't happen, if the Republicans do brinksmanship. So as that comes up, like, what is the thing that we demand to spend less money on? And I would represent that work requirements would be the right fight. Like we send a we send so much money right now to able-bodied people who could work but choose not to. And we do it through state programs that access federal drawdowns, we do it through Medicaid expansion, we do it through different features of Obamacare, voluntary pre-k, all the all those different social service programs. And if you had work requirements in order to access those for able-bodied people, then I think that would be anti-inflationary, that would reduce some of the mandatory spending and the entitlement spending and I think people could get that right as opposed to just like trying to walk everybody through an economics pie chart as the Democrats are accusing us of brinksmanship so with the economy tanking can you please give us some insider uh, con congressional trading tips please <laughs> <laughs> so that's enough by the way another area where the populist right and populist left should work together I do not believe that members of Congress should trade individual stocks yeah. we have information 
that other people do not. And we have the ability to impact how various companies do mm -hmm. based on the types of programs we authorize or uh, or, or that we pull. Pass, yeah. And so it's just crazy to me that that was ever allowed. And uh, you're talking about, you know, big tech bills and like potentially breaking up Facebook. And just imagine if you're about to even vote on that. And then you go and you know put option get put options. I mean, on the, Facebook that, that's not a hypothetical. That happened. I mean, we had bills that were moving through the judiciary committee that passed out of the judiciary committee that broke up big tech, and we were all getting ready for them to come to the floor. And on the dip, Paul Pelosi bought a bunch of those stocks. Wow. And then guess what? Guess what, Tim? They never fucking came to the floor. Wow. What a surprise. Now, these people are evil. What? Man. That's like what they did about Napoleon, the British, where they said Napoleon lost the war or won the war. Everyone sold their British stock. A bunch of rich British businessmen bought it up. And then they're like, actually, he, he's still fighting. So you're saying go long or short on Tesla stock? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking someone, notes here. Someone needs to clip that Paul Pelosi thing and put it on Twitter. Have you, Absolutely. Have you guys talked yeah. about like defaulting on the Federal Reserve debt? And just telling this private, quasi private public company, like, we're not your bitch. We are, you work for us. We allow you to exist. And we're not, we can't pay debt that we don't have. You, you borrow $10 trillion, you can't pay back 15. You only have 10. <laughs> we ain't got it. We take a post dated check. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, cause we're talking about, like, where are we gonna get the money if we, for the debt ceiling thing? Like, what about we just don't Dude, pay the I would the never wanna be your landlord. Like, you know what? The answer is, I don't have it. I'm all about small business. But I do feel like it's like, how do I get this parasite out of my brain without killing myself, the Federal Reserve? Like, it's, it's in our system right now. It has been in control since 1913. But, like, what? And they had one job. And it was not to let the economy overheat so that we got to this level of inflation. And yeah, they did it in seriously. 1928. <laughs> right. It happened in 28. I mean, the, the Great Depression was a direct result of these banksters, you know, yeah. deciding when and how we can run our, our lives. So does that ever come up? Do you guys talk a lot about the Federal Reserve and, and breaking it up or just take Congress taking control of the monetary supply? Well, in, in our lifetime, you've seen Congress devolve more power than it has claimed. And so in a lot of ways, it's a way for members of Congress to avoid a great deal of accountability for the economy, to just act as though it's a bunch of nerds with green eye shades at the Fed that turn dials up or down that cause the economy to react in various ways. So the answer is no. Damn. And it's because they don't want to get stuck with the bag if and when the economy actually does crash. Right. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think that's reprehensible because that's the, one of the sole jobs of Congress is to protect the monetary supply. Well, and, and instead, you get the $1.7 trillion Omni, which is why this fight mm -hmm. we had this last week matters, because it's only ever going to be the way it's going to be until you force change and until you use the leverage you have. And like, think about it. If a Republican was president, I would have never been able to pull off what, what we pulled off because people would have said, oh, like, you're getting in the way of the Trump agenda or the, you know, the Bush agenda or whatever. But because Biden was there, Schumer was in the Senate, like there wasn't this intense pressure to organize the House immediately. And we had the ability to be more deliberative and to get the structural concessions to stop that and to regain that power. You mentioned yeah. earlier how you guys were like kind of working, the populists were working together and then January 6th comes along and we talk about like, who let those people into that door? Like who, who hit the magnetic unlock and like let those people walk in from the inside? And now we're seeing because of January 6th, the populist right and the populist left are at odds. It's like as if division was sown. By whom? I don't know. But for some reason, because of this event that happened where people were let into that freaking building by some people, now there's the, now we have congressional division, which didn't seem similar with Occupy Wall Street. We were well, all there well, together. To, to elaborate on that, talk about the Fed's direction. You talked about this a year ago, the January 6th. Well, the I mean, we, we already know, based on the whistleblower interviews that we've done, that there were federal agents and federal assets that were on the ground that day. And what we don't know is the extent to which any of those assets or agents increased the level of cr criminal acuity coordinated with one another or purposefully entrapped folks who were otherwise not wanting to hurt anyone or violate any law in some sort of technical violation of trespassing or uh, crossing some barrier that had existed hours earlier but th that had been taken down. And it's noteworthy to me that it's been the Department of Justice fighting tooth and nail against the release of a lot of the documentary evidence that would answer these questions. And who was Ray Epps? Ray Epps is, an, is the only person involved in January 6th that Adam Kinzinger will continuously defend. Isn't that something? And, and why? I mean, I think a lot of people have assumptions. He's somehow connected with feds, 
or he maybe testified or something. Well, I just don't, I, there's no rational explanation for how this guy is sending out message saying he orchestrated the activity. Is at every critical point, he's like the Forrest Gump of the January 6th <laughs> string of events, right? And then when you're able to isolate the people that are pulled off of the FBI's most wanted lists and the people who, you know, seem to be encouraging others and moving others that like, it's like, Ray, you know, Ray Epps did nothing. So they'll go and like raid the home of some like couple in Homer, Alaska, because they think they have Nancy Pelosi's laptop. But this guy who was at the center of the action, it's like nothing to see here. So, you know, I, I am troubled by the disparate treatment that Epps gets compared to like some, you know, grandmother that wandered past a barricade that then is facing some intense criminal process from mm -hmm. DOJ. I'm concerned that those people in detention are becoming radicalized just by being forgotten and left to rot. Like, uh, do you know what the status is of these people that have been in prison? Are well, you we've gotten varying reports on that and not nearly enough information. And a lot of them have been deprived of just like basic civil rights when it comes to the adversarial judicial process. One thing I'm investigating right now is the extent to which the public defenders that were assigned to a lot of these folks like hated them and wanted the book thrown at them and were posting on social media and texting their friends, you know, about the the nature of those proceedings. So that's a big area of concern for me, how they were treated in prison uh, and in jail, in the D.C. jail in particular. Uh, I went there, man, it, was, it was pretty crazy. I, I went there and they like locked us out of uh, being able to do an inspection. And that's unprecedented for a member of Congress to not have the ability to inspect a facility that is under the control of the federal government at some level. Could you go to Guantanamo when that was open? Is it still still open? could? Yeah. If you got if you got the plane, we could go tonight. That's hard. Get, get, get an authentic mojito. Oh, I'm so into it. <laughs> Have you been there before? I don't want to go to Gitmo. You crazy? Well, I'm, I'm, are you insane? Ian? Tactics. You ever, you insane? Ever, you ever I'm, not, the, I'm not falling for that one, you status. Ever, <laughs> you, ever, you, you, ever, you ever see the meme that said, waterboarding at Guantanamo Bay sounds really fun if you don't know what it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, horrible. <laughs> yeah, no thank you. What are you trying to set me up here, Ian? Yeah, man, bring your camera. <laughs> I don't know. Are you allowed to bring a camera inside there? There is a number of these cases where people were engaged in journalism and are facing charges that are more akin to insurrection, like people who are there trying to film and capture the event and then, you know, are getting multi-year prison sentences. Is this like Patriot there's Act been, stuff? Uh, there's been 950 people charged so far, but the DOJ is saying that the investigation is far from over. And recently through a, a congressional bill, they even got more funding and they're saying that they're going to be doubling the amount of people that they already arrested. So. Can you, can you guys I, I, had a, I, had a, I had a whistleblower come to me um, and, and talk about how these specialized units that have FBI, CIA, that were targeted at extremism in, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, you know, all over the world, that now those very same teams and those very same tools and those very same national security authorities are exclusively being turned inward, mm -hmm. you know, to instead instead of finding, you know, somebody that's building a bomb to blow up an embassy abroad, they're like, you know, analyzing what some guy who lives in his mom's basement is putting on his blog that's read by tens yeah. of people. Yeah. And then the, and that now after they were turned inward as a result of this om, omnibus spending legislation, they are flooded with cash. I mean, just so much money that is now in the hands of these people who wake up every day saying, you know, how can I go find a white supremacist extremist to hunt down? And, you know, if if you create an industry of witch hunters, right, like you're going to find more witches, like even if they're not actually witches. And as you mentioned in the beginning of this broadcast, this was originally created. This industry was created by George W. Bush. It was created by the Republicans right after 9-11, yeah. passing the Patriot Act, allowing Homeland Security to do whatever they want, allowed, allowing the TSA to touch you wherever they wanted to. And, and, and I think this is why there needs to be a bigger call out of this old Republican guard of these neocons that created this situation that's literally being turned around and used against the American people. The war on terror is now the war on America. And 
it's the intelligence it's the intelligence agencies waging it against American citizens, yeah. which is crazy. Well, we have to have the guts to repeal those authorities. And the thing is, anytime you get any momentum behind any effort to do that, you get the neoconservatives running in saying, well, you're going to be the reason there's another 9-11. Hmm. And then people fold. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Sounds like a threat more than anything else. Well, yeah, well, it just it, it is a way to test people's will. And the will often does not rise to the occasion. That's why these authorities don't get curtailed. Purely because the people are afraid that they'll be become i mean honestly i could see why because if something did happen then they might feel guilt but like uh all right this is going to take another couple hours to talk about i don't think we're gonna be able to finish this one right now all right do you do, do you repeal do you the patriot the, act well do you have the power to actually put a stop to this j6 nonsense unilaterally no the house won't have the power to do that uh i do believe that substantial elements of the national security apparatus and these these prosecutions need to be defunded do i think there's a critical mass of republicans who are willing to shut down the government over it no but we have to go make our case and and the thing we got to do is like build the deterrent against it like a lot of these folks in for all their tough talk and for all they're willing to do when they have anonymity when you drag them before the country and ask them tough questions as i've done with some of the leading figures in the national security state before the judiciary committee they don't like that too much and when you do it to a few of them the rest of them get adrift and see that and you know that works to a point but it 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 pales when you compare it to these exquisite authorities that have been turned inward and then the extreme resourcing of them that we have just seen. So we need like a, a we need the population to speak up and start making noise about repealing the Patriot Act. I, th I think that that the Patriot Act was a terrible mistake for our country. And I would I would advocate for its repeal. Are there it's things so esoteric? You know, how do you convince, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way. We, we were talking earlier about how you mentioned Ian Dave Smith's thing that if you want to see who we're going to go up against next, look at who we're funding now. We fund Ukraine. We fund Azov. In 20 years, we may be fighting them like we did with the Mujahideen and then the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, etc., Afghanistan. But the kids who vote in favor of those wars, the people right now, the young people who are liberals who are voting for you know, this policy, weren't alive when, these, when we were funding these, these groups. right? Like I, I think I was a baby when the Mujahideen stuff was happening. And so then I'm 20 years old. I vote, you know, I was 18, I don't know how old I was, I vote for Obama, and then he's just continuing this cycle of war against who we had just been funding. With Ukraine, give it 20 years, some young person's gonna be like, gotta vote Democrat, they're the ones who are fighting against these evil Nazis, the and difference, it's like, they're the ones who funded it. That's, the good thing though now is there's so much media on this that it may be unforgettable in the consciousness. I mean, obviously there's manip it's being manipulated to show you one or the other you know, way of looking at the situation, but people that are six may be very well aware of what's happening in Ukraine when they're 18. As opposed to in, in Iraq, 2003, there was no internet video, so or was very little of well, it. Well, in the 90s, there wasn't, I mean, other than maybe Pat Buchanan and, and a few of his buddies, there wasn't a, a, an anti-war segment of the political right with any actual power, right? And I think that it's because the millennial generation has grown weary of this. I mean, all of our lives, our country has been in some state of low-yield war, and we see the people come back with broken limbs and broken hearts and broken minds. We see the effect on marriages, the drug abuse, the suicide, mm -hmm. and we start to see the real cost of it. And now on the right, there are people willing to ask tough questions about these things. And, and that scrutiny just didn't exist on a lot of these other misadventures. Well, well, if when, only we would have listened to Ron Paul. When, when you were younger, we still can. When, uh, when like the Patriot Act was getting voted on and stuff, were you like a young conservative? Yeah, I think I, I adhered to a lot of the kind of Republican thinking on those things. I, I thought Bush was a great president uh, initially. And then, you know, as I, as I started to see in my heavily military community the impacts of these wars, I just thought like, man, like trading a bunch of sand dunes around in Iraq like isn't worth like Chris's dad not having legs. Wow. You know, and you, you see that over and over and it, it Im impacts you. And not only that, these interventions also created more future conflicts. It not only allowed Iran to have more of a sphere of influence in the region, but because we, we went in there and overthrew the government, we created <coughs> ISIS in so many different ways by incentivizing that group to start up there and to also hand over a lot of American military technology and, and weapons 
right directly into their hands, giving us a new enemy to fight and use them as pawns to overthrow the One Syrian government. One thing I government. told Trump is that it was all, no matter what the policy area was, it was always the neocons that stabbed him in the back yeah. first. <laughs> you know, if you just wanted to take like a crude uh, way to triage like the people that stabbed him in the back that were part of his own administration, mm -hmm. it was always the neocons. Why did you think he kept coming to them, asking them for hugs all the time and giving them all these lucrative positions of power? I want to ask something for the audience. A lot of people are asking about the ATF passing a new rule on uh, pistol braces. Do you see this, yes, Luke? Yes, yes. They're, 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 they're saying they're NFA items now. Basically, they're banning them. I'm curious. Uh, abolish the ATF? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms is just what we call a good Saturday night in my district. Or it should be the name of a store, not you know an agency. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, they, there is a deep state at the ATF. I mean, no doubt. And during the Trump administration, it was actually pretty bad. There, the, A lot of the rules that they were passing were converting people into criminals who had no intention of violating the law whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't even think that you should be able to like seriously debate gun legislation if you're not from an SEC state. You know, when I see like the Northeasterners, you know, get all worked up and they don't know anything about firearms, they haven't used firearms, they haven't stored firearms. Yeah. It's quite right. comical to see like David Cicilline from Rhode Island, or yeah. you know, uh, what was it? They Thomas Massey asked Jerry Nadler of New York, like, what does the AR stand for? And AR-15, and Nadler said assault rifle. Oh no! Yes. <laughs> so bad. What, what's SEC states? Like the Southeastern Conference, you know, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, like Texas. Hot. Well, you got New That's Hampshire right. up there too. New Hampshire and West, pretty, Virgi West Virginia's okay. constitutional carry. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if it matters. It's nine fourteen. Did you want to keep? Uh, honestly, going? I was. I felt bad for the audience because I knew I was going to cough a bunch. So I thought by now it would be full cough. I ass, can barely talk. sound good to me. I mean, all right. If they if they'll hang with me, I'll hang. Oh, with dude, people are people are loving it. They're so excited. I don't know if, if Luke, if you wanted to like, if you saw any specific questions in the super chats, because a lot of people are bringing up the ATF thing um, because uh, essentially what they're calling for is going to make a lot of Americans. Um, uh, felons, just like the kind of bump stock uh, ban that passed through Donald Trump that was just ruled unconstitutional. So other than the courts, is there any way to effectively lobby the ATF? Is there any way to stop them from, from essentially making legal law-abiding citizens felons overnight? Well, one tool that we got in these negotiations over the Speaker of the House is the reinstitution of something called the Homan Rule, where you can zero out the funding for a particular bureaucrat. So like imagine if you could have just isolated like Fauci's salary and zeroed it out and forced a vote on that. Couldn't do that before. You're not going to be able to do that. I suspect that some of us in the Second Amendment caucus will be visiting the, uh, the bureaucrats at the ATF with that tool. I'm looking at what, what's, the, what's the rule called? The, the Holman? Holman rule. How do you spell that? H-O-M-I-N is it? H-O-L-M-A-N. Oh, Holman. Yeah. Oh, Holman. Oh man, we didn't even talk about Fauci. Is he, is he well loved in Congress? Is it divisive? What's <laughs> what's his next gig? University know. president, we'll big here. pharma CEO, <laughs> the Pfizer. Podcaster. He's going to be the CEO of Pfizer. How can yeah. he not? Right? Yep. Yep. Something like that. Yeah. Board Would you hire Fauci if you knew that no matter what job it was, he was going to be spending like twenty hours a week in congressional depositions? I think he got a deal. I'd, I'd be willing to bet, like so many of these other uh, officials who have this, with you know, within this revolving door system, he probably cut a deal a long time ago. That when he's out, they'll pick him up. Speaking of the revolving door, another one of the like ethics things that I just don't understand how it's not the law now. If you are a member of Congress, you should never get to be a lobbyist or a registered foreign agent. But it is like two of the most frequent jobs that people get when they're done with the job I have is literally being a registered agent for a foreign government mm -hmm. or influencing people for money. And I don't, I don't get why it's not like a total common sense thing to say, like, you've got to choose one path or the other. Mm -hmm. like you, if you want to go be a foreign agent, and if you want to get paid money to influence outcomes, then that means you don't get to be one of the lawmakers. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I believe it was Joe Rogan uh, a couple months ago was interviewing someone that was uh, making the claim that members of Congress were getting different kind of treatment for COVID than the rest of the general public was. Do you know if that's particularly true? I know we talked about this. Yeah. Um, do you remember who the guest was? Because I can't remember mm -hmm. that off the top of my head right now. But that was the accusation. Is that accusation true that Congress gets a, a different kind of health care system than the American people do when it came to COVID? No, nah, man, we're like, most of us are on the DC Obamacare exchange. So you got uh, Obamacare. Is I it, got Obamacare. It, did you get COVID? What's up with this? I hear like members I of did. Congress sleeping in their office. Yeah, uh, more than 100 of the 435 members of Congress, when they're in 
uh, Washington, D.C. actually live inside of their office. And uh, I did that until I met my now wife, and she made it very clear that that was not an arrangement that she was going to be tolerant of. Just because they want to save money? Uh, it's, it's the money. Uh, I mean, a lot, you know, though no one should ever worry about members of Congress and our economic standing. I mean, people who have, you know, maybe a spouse that doesn't work, that's raising a family, you know, maintaining two residences on a congressional salary is challenging for some people. I, uh, I mostly like Airbnb it uh, because uh, mm-hmm. I have the like Yasser Arafat theory that you never want to sleep in the same bed twice. What's this, what's this, what's this thing I'm hearing that y'all are getting a $34,000 raise? Is that true? Uh, no one's told me that. There was an article in the Daily Mail that said that uh, one of the last things the Democrats did before the end of the last session was put in a raise of $34,000 uh, from members of Congress. I'm, I'm una- unaware of any raise, but uh, if, if, that's, if that's true, the margaritas are on me after the show. <laughs> Elon Musk probably is going to like to hear that the members of Congress are sleeping in their own office. Uh, but it, it, there's, there's also- a lot of rodent activity at night, too, because they're always working on that building. Wow. Pay bump. There you go, man. To ask you about it just could give could give. Oh yeah, no, that's a that's a per diem. Uh, there's Congress was like weirdly cut out of the GSA per diem, and so that would allow Congress to access the the GSA per diem. Which is like while you're working away from home, you're, that'll be your budget. Right. So if like if I bring an employee from Pensacola up to Washington to work on a legislative issue for a week, they get a per diem, but we don't. So this would equalize. I was going to ask you, what do you think about what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter? And do you think there's going to be any kind of retribution against him since he did expose how essentially the intelligence agencies were pretty much running big tech social media? Is there going to be like some bureaucratic investigations? Are they going to try to take away some of his funding from some of his spaceships? How do you think that's going to You already to saw Chris Murphy call for <laughs> reviews of the different foreign investors in the Musk Twitter deal. So... It's not a question of if that will happen. That that is happening now. It's just a question of uh, the level of acuity of it. Mm-hmm. And and you know, there's so many of my Republican colleagues that are like, "Yay, you know, Twitter's ours now. Elon bought Twitter. Rah rah. You know, uh, wave the pom poms for Elon." And I'm I'm glad he bought it. I'm glad Twitter's more of a democratized, free speech speech space. But like. Is this what we is this what we have to wait for? That we have to wait around for some like right wing billionaire to come buy stuff so that we can have a playground? I just don't want to live in a world where the terms of service on social media become more important than the values that undergird the Constitution. Right? Yeah, like, it's, it's a cultural question, though, right? It just seems like it seems so low T to sit around and cheer on Elon while like we are the board of directors of the most powerful country in the world and we do nothing while the digital marketplace of ideas is zapped of any conservative thought. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think relying on any one guy is the right move. It's way, cause his emotions can change his behavior. We say he wouldn't let Alex Jones back on. Cause he's like, no, I don't like what he said about kids about Sandy hook stuff. Like, uh, uh, but at but at least like you see John it. Astor. John Astor started a story in New York. I mean, he just bought the entire, I don't know the exact history, but because of one billionaire or whatever he was worth, we have Astoria. And like we have communities, like one rich guy can build a community. It's a little culty, but it's kind of like the history of our, of our species. I don't know if we need that. Like I think that we can legislate away the problems sometimes, but a lot of times I think it's in the private sector. I don't know. Like the government's really good. What I really love the government for is to tell us when something has gone too far and to stop it from happening as opposed to making all these things happen all the time. Like, that's up for the populace to do. Yeah, but wouldn't you agree that these tech companies getting more power than most of the governments that have ever existed in all of human history is that threshold where they've gone too far? Yes, yes, it's gone too far. It needs to be broken up in a way that I, I think needs to be novel. That's and why. And so I'm then the go. dispute among some working on the issue is do you use, like, the force of law to break them up? Or do you, like, almost do what happened to the tobacco companies in the 90s where you strip their immunities and then sick the trial lawyers on them. Well, oh. they're still they're still acting in the benefit of a lot of government agents. So I don't see them being put in check until they stop actually taking the orders from government and not doing what the government really wants them to do. Um, well, and so the that's people the who would be litigating here. against them in court want their next job to be at big tech. Mm. You know, I mean, the revolving door is kind of a consistent theme of our of our discussion today. But look at how many people go working from from FBI, DOJ, CIA, NSA, and their next job is in Silicon Valley. 
It's a huge percentage. Yeah, if you remove the the immunities of what they did in the tobacco companies, then you're thinking maybe the or or, or might what happen is they won't prosecute properly because they want to get jobs there even if they don't have immunity. What I've seen so far is that the folks at DOJ want to be like just enough of a parasite that never kills the host. So, you know, they want to be just enough of a pain where they maximize their own economic value to then go and work for the big tech companies afterwards. Mm. Man, that's a good question. Would we use the government to break it up or just strip their immunity and let the law take take Luke, its course? And this is the issue that Jim Jordan and I disagree on. You know, Guy, as we've talked about, I have tremendous respect for, but he prefers more of a judicial route and I prefer more of a legislative route. I, I prefer uh, the government stop controlling big tech social media and stop manipulating the platform for their own personal benefit. That's me. And I think if we stop that, and, and, and we also have to understand uh, uh, government allowed these companies to have a monopoly on the market. There's no way to even compete against them because of the unfair advantage that they got from members of Congress. And, and, and whether it's tax incentives, whether it's Google Maps getting the data from the U.S. military, there's there's so much of, of them just working hand in hand that I don't even see the big difference between you know big tech social media and the government sometimes, to be honest with you. Well, big tech is owned by someone. Like government, at least, is, is we the people. But I, I do but think- they're still acting like a vehicle for, is, for is the it, private though, state. Matt, is it, is it still we the people with government? I, I think members of Congress should have to wear the patches of their PAC and lobbyist donors like NASCAR drivers yeah. have to wear their sponsors. Yeah, I think Bill Hicks made that joke uh, originally and, I love and it. he was prophetic and I absolutely agree with him 100%. We should do like an augmented reality VR app or, or AR app where you put on the glasses and you can see like the augmented reality of all the donors on all their clothes. You can see the lobbyists uh, yes. standing behind them <laughs> yeah. with their right. hands on their shoulders. Like in an aura, just like floating above. You see <laughs> yeah. like big pharma, big tech, defense contractors. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a joke meme that came out, but is, is very, very, should should be. Like on their desk, you should see all the all the people that have donated to their behavior because they're supposed to represent their 700,000 constituents. Well, well we it's just the most insulting thing when you go try to persuade someone to change their viewpoint or to develop their viewpoint and they literally refer you to the lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Like I've had that happen with colleagues where I'm like, hey, look, I really want to talk to you about this insurance issue. And they're like, okay, great. As soon as I hear from the state farm and all state lobbyists that like your change is an appropriate one, then I can be with you. That wow. it sounds and like an abdication like, of power. It's yeah, totally what, what is. Well, it's what so was, insulting to the members. You, you mentioned yeah. before the show that people pay each other for sponsorship. Well, uh, I was discussing the dynamic on the House floor. So on the floor of the House of Representatives, members enjoy broad immunities as a consequence of the speech and debate clause. And giving each other political donations to campaigns is permissible on the floor. And so, I mean, you can observe dynamics where someone is, in one sentence, soliciting your vote or co-sponsorship, and then in the very next sentence is talking, is handing you a check. So, so they don't directly say like, hey, I'll give you money if you vote for me. They'll say... Thanks for voting for me. By the way, here's two thousand dollars. Oh yeah, Tim, I'd really, really like you to consider co-sponsoring this legislation. It's real important to me, and I know that you've got a fundraiser coming up tonight. So here, I wanted to just come right to the floor and give you a check for it. <laughs> oh, but, on, so they man. can't specifically say vote for this money is so that you vote for me. They can't do that specifically, but they can be like, "Thanks for voting for me. Here's money." Yeah, it's it's always with uh, with a bit of a wink and a nod. Wow. It, are we still in control of the government, the people? What's your vibe, that's man? What I'm, that's what I'm saying. Well, look, what do you think we were doing this last week? You think it was the most comfortable thing in the world for 20 of us to try to send a shockwave through the D.C. cartel and say it's not just going to go the way it's always been and we shouldn't, we shouldn't just move people forward in a system that to its core is fundamentally corrupt with both parties? No, we wanted, we thought it should be about the policy, the procedure and the personnel, not just the distribution of funds and the alliances that creates. And for that, we were called the Taliban 20. Yeah. We were called the insurgency caucus. Terrorists. We were called to, and that was members of our own party. That wasn't even what the other party was calling yeah, us. Outside of McCarthy, do you fear retaliation in any other sense? Like there's a machine at play and you're, you're throwing a, a, a wrench in the spokes. I, I, you know, I swim fine in turbulent waters. <laughs> so I personally, I don't, but I, I, we all watch out for each other. You know, if someone were to retaliate against one of my colleagues who might have less notoriety, I would be there to have their back. And I, I would marshal every force that we have to ensure that that did not happen against the people that showed courage. But I, I don't even mean politically. I mean, just 
politics can be a dirty game well, depending on how serious things Tim, get. Tim, Google me. It's pretty hard to say worse things about me than yeah, they already have. And when you sort of have faced that down and taken their best shot, it builds calluses to become enduring and valuable in the next fight. I'm sure it actually kind of pissed you off and made you push 10 times harder. Liberating in a way. You know, when, when I was watching the McCarthy fight, you know, my attitude was like, the more I heard these stories where he was just like smugly rejecting you guys, I'm like, that probably made him double down. Well, we knew what we wanted. We knew what our goals were. And oftentimes, like, there are people in Congress who just want to be in the fight for being in, in, for the sake of being in the fight, like as an end unto itself. But we knew we had to get out of this system uh, a, a result that would prohibit the passage of an, another omnibus. And once we knew that, we were able to really direct a lot of our, our strategic decisions toward that goal. Didn't they like bring the omnibus like two years ago on like a wagon? They like wheeled yeah. it in. It was like five thousand pages. Yeah, nobody read that. That's crazy. That, and I'm like, who wrote it? Well, I mean, the lobbyists wrote it. <sighs> Literally, the, like lawyers that work oh, for yeah. Pfizer and yeah, things. Who like do you that? think writes this stuff? The lobbyists come and bring it to members. Members slap their name on it. It goes into the system. And, that should be illegal. And they never read it. They don't even know what's in the bill many times. Should be Sometimes illegal. they try to read them. And there's, I, many, I and there's many stories of people sneaking in stuff last minute and it becoming law well, as well. I mean, it can't, we can't make it illegal to be a lobbyist because people have a First Amendment right but to, to write a bill for someone else. Well, but that's a, that is a function of petitioning your government. To me, what's so offensive is that like when you've got the former chairman of these committees who hired all the staff that then roll out of their chairmanship, go right to K Street, and then are lobbying the people they hired we the people aren't in charge. Yeah. The highest bidder is in charge in a system like that. Fair point then. So what do we do? Well, I think we need broad ethics reforms. And the only way we get them is by uniting the populist right and the populist left. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why we shouldn't be working with the squad on a stock ban, on a stock trading ban. There's no reason we shouldn't be working with leftists on um, banning members of Congress from becoming foreign agents or lobbyists. And People have got to get over their egos. People have to know, you know, that, uh, you know, they got to get over January 6th or whatever it takes. But that, to me, that's the path. Is, um, it, is it possible right now, you think? I kind of feel It's never like been more possible because we get individual votes on stuff. Hmm. When you don't get individual votes, there's no accountability. Now, by House rule, there have to be individual votes. And the other thing is that our amendments have to be made in order. If we go get 20% of the House to sign on to an amendment, and that amendment is germane to the bill, it gets a vote. And some like little group of some College of Cardinals in the Rules Committee doesn't get to prohibit members from taking votes on those issues. And there are some who are in the very purple seats who are going to be uncomfortable about that because they're going to have to take a lot more votes than they might want to take. But that is what the job requires. I want to go to Super Chats, but I asked the audience a poll. I said, is Matt Gates the best member of Congress? 85% said yes. So there you go. My uh, mom wants the IP addresses of the other 15%. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Luke, do you want to, Luke and Ian, do you guys want to read Super Chats? Pick some? I don't sure. have them. I don't have them pulled up. Ian, do you have them pulled well, up? I can go through just from the YouTube uh, page itself. Yeah. Uh, let's start it off with David Berg. This is a, this is one, this is from like more, more recent to, to older, which is the, the reverse of what we normally do. But David said, uh, David Berg from Destin, Florida could not be more proud of my Congressman Matt Gates. You did what we elected you to do. Uh, it's great to hear from one of my actual bosses in, in Destin. That's in yeah. my district. Thanks, David. Yeah, right let's on. keep taking these. Yeah, I remember yeah, when I first got do. here, they like the leadership sat me down in one of these like uh, I don't know if you Dutch uncle that. talks you screen, and yeah. said, uh, well, Gates, you're just not a team player. And I said, no, like I, I'm a great team player. It's just that you all are not my team. My team are the 750,000 people who Look, you sent me here from Florida. Serge, try to find one as well. I got one here from uh, GOP Gamer who asks, can Congress label the ATF a state-sponsored terror organization? Dogs everywhere will thank you. So that's a, that's a super chat by GOP Gamer. And uh, Serge, pick up, pick up the next one. Uh, give me a second. No, 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 no that's a question uh, you know, if anyone wants to answer. All right. Can it be a, a state sponsor of terror? Let's just defund it. Let's just let's just isolate the bureaucrats there that make the bad decisions, zero out their salaries, and take away their authorities. I like the isolate bureaucrats thing. It's kind of like sanctions on an uh, on a opposing and an enemy. And, and think about it. You don't have to do it to all of them. You do it to a few, and it has a strong deterrent effect on the rest. That if they are promulgating some rule or advancing something that is indefensible, we're going to make them a star. 
Uh, Sloppy DMT Joe has a super chat that is asking legalized DMT question mark. Legalized what's, what's DMT? DMT? D- I mean, I, I've been for legalizing a lot, but I don't know what is that. Dimethyltryptamine is um, it's a chemical in your body that's basically kind of responsible for the dream state that we live in. This whole like dream of reality versus you know like and uh, it's secreted in your your body, uh, plants, things. But people in modern culture will get it out of ayahuasca. Have you you're familiar with the ayahuasca vine? Not America? personally. I, I I have friends who swear by it, but. Any drug that has it like a predicate that you like vomit and shit yourself is really not the type of experience I sign up for. <laughs> That's why you do fasting for a week right, beforehand because you're the, really just purging crap. Here's the next important question. Uh, should American citizens have the right to own nuclear weapons and biological weapons? No. You don't think? I think they should. Well, should is the wrong answer. I think. Is that what that silo was that I walked by on the way here? <laughs> the two silos, you mean. Oh, man. No, what I mean to say is not should is that uh, the Second Amendment says arms. If, if, if you don't think that's the case, then we've got to amend the Second Amendment. Because when they wrote it, privateers existed and they had weapons of, they, they, had, the equip, like they had weapons of war to an extreme degree. They had you know, uh, frigates and man of war, privateers, corsairs, etc. So I don't see how we've decided at some point outside of the Constitution that certain weapons are off limit to the people when they originally weren't. You see what I mean? Yeah. I understand. There nuclear weapons then. No, I get it. I mean, definitely if that were going to start, it would be in Florida. I mean, the Florida we, man would be the first. I, Florida well, man. Wasn't there a guy like who was uh, taking a, a mericium and he was making, he made a death ray? I think that was in Florida, wasn't it? I don't know. I could be wrong. We got another uh, uh, super chat by Dana Costello who's asking, what does Matt feel about auditing the Federal Reserve? I'm for it. I'm on Massey's bill to do that. Yes. Massey picked that up from, uh, from Ron Paul and I support it. And actually every Congress, we get more people on that bill. That's, That's awesome. S- Serge? You got one? Uh, yeah, I got one. Uh, Matt, what is being done to curtail the Federal Reserve's rapid march towards Weimar Germany-style inflation? Uh, what is America's breaking point? This is from uh, Hyat Sobo. Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, the, like the Grover Norquest view of conservatism was that if we could just cut taxes enough, you could kind of starve the beast, right? Mm, and that right. has proven false because we've, we've been pretty successful at stopping large – scale tax increases, but we've substituted Fed policy for it. And by the way, Mnuchin was one of the worst. Like if you look at what happened during COVID and all of the different Fed policy that was constructed then, that is badly in need of audit and was undeniably abused in a number of cases. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the Fed failed and it's one one job. It's only directive. Yeah. yeah of, of pushing against inflation. Mm. And uh it's yet another institution that continues to have less and less trust. We got another $5 super chat from David Troutman. He says, please don't cancel tomorrow. I'm driving up from Charlotte with guitars to play with for you guys. Tomorrow was not canceled, but Luke and Ian are too lazy to get up on time. Nah. <laughs> yeah, guys, right. if I, gotta do I it, feel assaulted at, yeah, that, that early. That unnecessary. <laughs> Hold yeah, on. That's absolutely crazy. They're, they're doing a meetup tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning in Washington, D.C. So I got one here just from, to clarify. from Kevin Sounds Malone. Like an insurrection. Yeah, it's going to be an <laughs> insurrectingly good time. Uh, will there be a zero-based balanced budget amendment? Uh, we will have a budget that balances over 10 years that all members will have to vote on. Uh, I think we should have the balanced budget amendment vote with that, and we, and we may. How do you balance a budget with inflation clawing up the back of our necks? Because like I don't know what the or I should say with the interest with interest right right but but they're related right because as you have the interest rates increase that the cost of that debt service balloons and then that eats up a greater and greater share of the budget and it's not discretionary you have to do it so do you just but how how do we pay off the interest to the Federal Reserve how much of actually. This is a real question. How much debt of the debt that we owe to the Federal Reserve is interest? Was accrued by interest, and how much of it is, oh, is base principal? I used to know this, but I don't know. Okay, because it, the rates have changed. Yeah. Um, but but I I uh, like look the drivers of the debt, the interest on the debt, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and so if you're not willing to attack Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid from an eligibility standpoint or a benefit standpoint, you're counting the number of angels on the head of a pin. I used to be like, yo, if people are sick, pay for their healthcare. And now I'm like, I watch people just continually drink poison and eat poison. And like, I can't keep 
paying money to keep those people well, alive. The, the thing that I don't get is why we subsidize the stuff that makes people sick. Like what we allow food stamps to pay for poisons people. And so we pay to like get people into this like diabetic state, then they get disabled, then we put them on SSID, then in the final, you know, six months of life, the the curve on the cost on spending on their health care goes through the roof and we do it all over again. And you know why? Because sugar companies and candy confectioners and big food get in there and ensure that we never reduce the amount of unhealthy stuff that we pay for for poor people. Yeah. As well as the subsidies for corn and soy, which help create uh, seed oils. But that's another thing. We got another $20 super chat from AJ that is asking, aside from Fauci, the public would like to see an investigation by the House into Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum, Soros and Gates. Make it happen, Matt. Winky face. That's the twenty dollars super chat. Well, let me let me let me flip flip that on you guys. I mean, you know, all right. The the weaponization against the American people select subcommittee meets for the first meeting. Who's your first witness? For what was the question? Again? So 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 we've Elon we've got, Musk. That that is a con, that is a very popular choice right now mm -hmm. among some Republicans. Now, the Dems then get to take their shots at him because we're not we're not like the, you know, Liz Cheney, Benny Thompson thing. We'll put actual Democrats on the committees because we want to have real debate. But uh, Elon would be a stellar first witness. Wow. Witness yeah. for well, I'm sorry, I was looking for the no, weaponization to, of media. Yeah, for the government. yeah to, okay. I mean, because because you get all of the features of the weaponization of our government through the Twitter files. You get the national security piece. You get the White House uh, officials trying to get information, uh, you know, either enhanced or diminished on Twitter. Uh, so you could open a lot of doors through that. You get the DOD. Think about that, how the DOD was involved in different like foreign policy narratives. I think he'd gladly do it. He'd be like, yep, tell yeah. me when to come talk. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, Sean Young has a $50 super chat asking, why is it criminal to lie when testifying before Congress, but not criminal to lie when you are holding a seat in Congress? Oh, tradition, mostly. <laughs> huh, I see. We got uh, another uh, $10 super chat by Gunface11 saying, can you abolish the NFA? We could. Hmm. We won't. <laughs> But I mean, we have the powers. Ian, uh, search. Yeah, yeah, let's do this one. Uh, oh, wait, did I read this one? All right, here we go. This one's actually kind of nice, although it's sad. Um, divine interventions. Is there anything that can be done at all? Is there any hope? Sounds like we're just going to end up in a dystopian dictatorship like China by the end of the decade. I'm severely black-pilled. Who was that? <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's divine interventions. Yeah. Divine intervention. Yeah, there's uh, there's some tension between the uh, the name and the sentiment that's expressed there. Um, you know, I encounter this actually pretty frequently at our town halls and rallies where people show up and say, you know, I came because I think you're fighting for us. But so there are some who think it's it's kind of all lost and. Whenever I get down, you know, Jim Jordan is, uh, is a guy who, who gives me comfort when he says, look, there's always a fight worth having in this place. Like, I have a job in the United States Congress where there, there are dozens of files on my desk every morning where it's someone who relies on me to, to pick up their cause and to go to battle for it. And if that can't get you up and that can't get you focused on being the best version of yourself, then nothing can. So that stops me from getting blackpilled because, you know, whether it's getting – a little old lady or IRS check that she was supposed to get and they screwed her over, whether it's the guy who has 22 EPA agents show up because he wanted to expand his cattle pond, um, you know, and you're able to get them off his back, um, or, or whether it's one of our service members that now we have to advocate for so that they can get their careers and their lives back after this foolish vaccine mandate was repealed. You know, there, there are still good things to do and good people that, that deserve us to be focused and not so diminished or discouraged that, that we don't get in, the, get in the fight for them. Okay. Yeah, we got, uh, they got two real fast. We got uh, Fat Barmuja who says Matt Gates rocks, which is a good one. There's a lot, a lot of people congratulating you and thanking yeah. you, by the way, in the chat and the super chats as well. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, uh, Matt, if the IRS abolishment fails, abol abolishment fails, we need you to end all. Uh, yeah, we need you to move to end all federal withholding, make people realize the taxes they pay end quarterly payments and make them pay once a year. This is the way to change things in regards to taxes in the IRS. Yeah, according no, to them. That's a key leverage point. The withholding absolutely is. Let me ask you guys this question. So the House gets in our first bill, abolish 87,000 IRS agents. Hmm. But like we know 
that that has no chance of a hearing in the Senate. It's never going to get signed by Joe Biden. And so how we use our floor time, like th th I guess there is a role for those messaging bills that just lay out what our principles are. But like there's a part of me that where there's like a little disingenuousness to it, right? Where all yeah. of my colleagues are putting out press releases and social media statements, you know, we did it, you know, we abolished the 87,000 IRS agents. And it's like, man, no, you didn't. Like be straight with your constituents that yeah. we are in divided government. And the way to be successful in divided government is you have to lay out a vision with one hand, but you have to use specific leverage points. And so what I've encouraged Republicans to do is develop a battle plan, right? On the debt limit, what is it that we are demanding in that fight? On the National Defense Authorization Act, is it the reinstatement of our military? Is it zeroing out the Ukraine funding? What is it that we're fighting for there? On the farm bill, what is it that we're f that is most critical there? Is it food stamp reform? You know, and so oftentimes we get into this legislation and everybody's after their disparate piece, but there's not real a, really a clear vision of what victory looks like on those you know must pass bills hmm. and. Knowing that, I think on the front end, would get more buy-in where we had more of a populist energy to these reforms. Hmm. Fizzy Bear is asking, has there been any talk to pass a law that will prevent the U.S. government from creating a central bank digital currency or at the very least require the government to always have a forum uh, of physical cash that can not be traced? No. All right. What do you got on, on the crypto? Where do you guys fall on the crypto reg stuff? I think that we're in new place. So if you get crypto rewards from a website, um, and then they're worth a dollar each every token, but then they drop to ten cents, the government, from what I can tell, wants to come in and tax you on each of those as if they're still worth a dollar because that's what they were when you got them, which is unconscionable. So I think it should be either they tax at the current value or the lowest value it's been in the last year when they're taxing the value of your crypto tokens. But not just the taxes, even the regulation of the marketplaces. Does, is, does FTX function as such a game changer that, that those marketplaces don't just become some offshore abyss? No, uh, they will always be offshore. There's nothing we can do to stop. We can only hamper our own ability to create new currency if we start, because of Sam's horrible misuse of, of, of funds at FTX. Like what that guy did is worse than what Bernie Madoff did. Yeah. That's not a reason to destroy the market. Although this is the thing, man. We're talking about inflation. When you create a new cryptocurrency, that's adding to more inflation. We're making more and more money. So I can't tell some days whether I want to see like Sam Bankman freed in a jail cell or if we should just pardon him and put him in charge of Social Security. Because like if we're going to run a Ponzi scheme, like maybe we should find the guy that's the best at it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't that good. He kept yeah. doing a lot of different Fair. stuff and having Fair. a lot of different parties. We got another super chat well, by Kay uh, Ben. Quick. Yeah, we got oh, it from Kay Ben really fast. Uh, oh. it's, uh, right. That's the same one. Yeah, yeah it's the same one. Uh, but yeah, Matt, uh, what? Who do you think? Trump's VP pick, VP pick should be? Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Hmm. Assuming she does a good job as governor of Arkansas, which I believe she will. Like, look, I is mean- Is there a reason why? Yeah, I think the reason Trump won in 2016 is because a whole lot of women who didn't like him voted for him because they could not stand telling their daughters and granddaughters that Hillary Clinton was the first female president of the United States. <laughs> And what I've said to President Trump is like, you have to create a permission structure where women who do not like you vote for you again. Mm -hmm. And like, you see the grit of a Sarah Huckabee Sanders. You see the directness, the efficacy, um, she, really bold steps. Her first days as governor banning TikTok on a lot of the government devices there. <coughs> She's the kind of person I'd look at. Christy Nome also, mm -hmm. I think would be, uh, would be a pretty stellar pick. Okay. We got another $50 super chat by N7 Wolf Archive asking, I am a Brit. I want to live in the United States, but I am stopped by the vax mandate. Is there a way Congress can stop it? We want you to stay in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> We're tired of Britain being overrun. My God. I mean, you think about the way immigration has fundamentally changed the country. Oh, how, yeah, how, is, how is what has happened there not a more prescient warning yeah. sign to yeah. our country for real i watch all the lotus eaters episodes shout out to the lotus eaters i'm sure you're cool with that tim oh yeah uh, big fan carl yeah, benjamin yeah good friend yeah and uh I, I watch all of it i mean i've lived all over the world my whole life and it's it's unthinkable to me that you just open your borders but i mean you know 
not to look at us or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> it's it's like a holdover from when we had very low population in the 1800s. And it's like, yo, bring your tired, your hungry, and your poor. We need a population. Now we're like oversaturated with population. Yeah. We don't need more people. We need great people, but we don't need like masses of people. Well, well and, and, and I mean, it, it's it's a misnomer to suggest that America has not increased and restricted immigration throughout times in our history when it has suited us. And whenever we have had mass waves of immigration. It has come with times of strife and conflict. And we invite that now without a real appreciation for the consequence. Hmm. Serge, can you go in the beginning? Because there was a lot of Super Chats in the beginning, and I'm only seeing the latest ones. You're able to see Is all the Is the Super ones Chat the like the podcast version yeah, of like well, when people pay the yeah. uh, dueling pianos <laughs> guy to like play a certain song? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's right. I got one here from Ben Avalone. Uh, says he's compromising compromising my rule of never posting on YouTube for this super chat. Small tech business owner in Pensacola here. Didn't vote for Gates in recent midterm. Always vote third party as middle finger to the system as a matter of principle. Consider my mind changed, sir. Well done, sir. Oh, oh I appreciate that very much. Ben Avalon. I will be your middle finger, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> the appendage. I assure you a vote from me will still send a middle finger to plenty. We got a $10. My promise to you. We got a $10 super chat by Watman13 asking, how about a time on the floor to read bills longer than 50 pages? No one can leave until it's been read through. Yeah, it's a good one. Oh, that Massey does that sometimes. So it's usually by unanimous consent that the bill is not read aloud. <laughs> and uh, so Massey has gone down in times of frustration and required uh, the reading of the bills, which really only punishes the clerk, right? Because members aren't there. How about a requirement that folks actually show up for debate? Because in the state legislature, your ass had to be in the seat and you had to be there because we took votes when the debates occurred. And so you got the benefit of hearing the different sides of an argument. The way it works in Congress is all day, like, you know, two, three, five people go debate the issues on the floor. And then at night we come in and take a series of votes on all those matters. And there's no real requirement that people even appreciate the subtleties and nuances of the policy choices. Marjorie was telling us that Typically on votes, people aren't even there at all. And it's like five people here and five people there. And they just go like, nah, and then let's pass. And they bang the gavel. Yeah, which was really the mistake Pelosi made in taking Marjorie off committees. Because then Marjorie was the warden of the floor. She would go down to the floor and demand votes and call the question. And uh, I thought that was a pretty good thing for the process. Uh, if, uh, if Pelosi were in charge again, she'd probably put Marjorie on all the committees. <laughs> yeah. We got a question from Ben D., uh, it says, Mr. Gates, you say Congress shouldn't trade individual stocks. Does this also include the options, futures, FX, uh, and or any other type of security or derivative? Yeah, because we can impact the value right. of those things. Right. And we know when the value is changing based on the briefings we get that the rest of the American people don't get. Right, totally. A1 has a $20 super chat asking you, uh, Matt Gates, does the USA need a third political party? What are your thoughts? I don't know. I mean, what? The, the first two we have are so bad. <laughs> one and a third one. Um, I, I think we need capture of our existing parties by people who are, are at least like ideologically informed. Because right now, there are times when it feels like it doesn't even matter which party wins the election, because all you're really deciding is who gets to be the lead valet for the same special interests. Like, it's gut-wrenching to see, like, oh, well, we won. We've been promising the American people for four elections that we're going to repeal Obamacare. And then Paul Ryan goes and takes $14 million from HMOs in the nine weeks preceding the rollout of our health care bill. And guess what? It doesn't repeal Obamacare. It just repositions it in a way that protects the profits and the guaranteed revenue stream for health insurance companies and, and health management companies. And so, you know, I've seen the power change but the bosses never really do. Did Paul Ryan pocket that money or any of that money? Oh, it all went to his political fund. But, you know, the, the pressures on the presiding officers for fundraising are intense. You know, they got to raise like a million bucks a day, you know, when we are in legislative session. And Paul Ryan told me, yeah, you know, I have to go to three dinners every night and every dinner has to do about 300,000 bucks. What are they raising money for? What's the point? Campaigns. But what? just to spend money on people door knocking. Well, and advertising. I mean, and, and what I sort of figured out is, well, I mean, you can do, there are these people who whore themselves out for 
donations from lobbyists and special interests. And then they use that money to go buy 30 seconds on new, the news programs. And so instead of doing all that, why not just go be on the news programs? Yeah. You know, start a YouTube channel. Exactly. Well, yeah, yeah. Do you have a YouTube channel? Uh, I don't. I do actually. I do uh, at Rep Matt Gates. At Rep Matt. Yeah, Rep Rep Mac Gates. Gates. yeah, that's what I feel at. like th that got a podcast called Firebrand. Ooh, that could America's actually... 57th favorite political podcast. Hell that's yeah. great. But this could actually be a, a solution to a certain degree of getting money out of politics. Yes. You can you can promote yourself. Right. And why not just do the thing that you would otherwise spend the money on? And maybe if we didn't take such crappy positions and put the lobbyists in charge of the agenda, it wouldn't take $10 million to go win an election. Right. Yeah. Jay Lincoln has a $20 super chat asking, what do you think about Texas Pelosi walking back the terrorist claim? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is quite the moniker. <laughs> that was good. Uh, I am glad that Congressman Crenshaw clarified that he was using hyperbole when using the terrorism label. I know Dan Crenshaw doesn't think I'm a terrorist. But I know they were frustrated with the tactics we used. They were hardball tactics. Sometimes that's what the job requires. Bonnie Swevlik asks, what are your thoughts on Texit? On what? Texit. Oh, Texit. That's like Texit. Oh, no. We are one country. I am not for yeah. this like secession Hell yeah. stuff. I mean, I love this country, and I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't buy into any of that worldview. What about a new state in Northern California, Idaho, the state of Jefferson? I haven't spent as much time up there. The, 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 so these are areas like Eastern Oregon, Idaho, Northern California, which tend to be more conservative, and they want to be their own state separate from the dense liberal areas because it's a very different group of people. Yo, did you see how many of the recent counties just voted to actually vote on it and actually uh, try Jefferson? to join? Yeah, to, or not, not to join Jefferson, but to join Idaho, like the greater Idaho movement. You see oh, how right. many? It's like a lot of Eastern Oregon. Has I didn't joined. know Idaho, Idaho was so hot right now. Oh, oh dude, it's yeah, very it's trendy. Idaho. It really is. It really is. People right. are trying to move there. Too yeah, many. But, but, uh, the As a Florida man, I live in the best state in the country, so I, <laughs> I'm unfamiliar with these gripes. Hey. Ditto. Same. I'm a Florida <laughs> man you. as well. I'm, I'm going back there in a few days. Uh, we got another great super chat by Brandon Hurt, and he's asking, what is the when, when there's a hot issue in Congress, what is the best way to communicate with my representative? Email, voicemail, what is it? Good it's question. different for different members, and you need to know what that leverage point is or influential point is of uh, four members. I mean, I get on Twitter spaces at night. I'm mm -hmm. real active at re responding to comments on social media. But, you know, for some of my colleagues who are septuagenarians and octogenarians, like they get handwritten reports every day about who called the landline. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you it's important to get some intelligence. Part of political tradecraft is knowing what influences people. And what frustrates me is like when what influences them is, well, you know, Facebook hired Chuck Schumer's daughter. Do you think you're going to have like an honest conversation with Chuck Schumer about regulating Meta? Right. I got one from Patrick. Uh, he asked, Matt, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on the current state of the military and the impact of woke ideologies on service academies in particular. What are your thoughts? No, this is this is something not a lot of people are talking about. But yeah. the uh, diminution in interest in even serving in the military and especially the like service academies, it's palpable. Yeah. When I first got this job. The coolest part of it was nominating young people to our service academies because you get to see the best of your district. And so I had every valedictorian, salutatorian, club president, captain of the football team applying for these spots. And now the average test scores are lower. The average leadership positions are far fewer. The average GPA class rank down because the best of the best no longer want to go to West Point, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy. There are a few uh, who do, but the the gestation period for that consequence is, is pretty long, right? And mm -hmm. we're gonna be feeling the effects of this in decades because we weren't getting patriotic, God-fearing Americans into those positions. And you know, representing the district I do, it's heartbreaking to hear that I've got units that are having less live fire training, less or fewer jumps, capabilities reduced and they're spending all their time in DEI, you know, sessions and yeah. learning about what pronouns are acceptable and not acceptable in the reserves. There are people reporting to me that you can't say mother and father. You just have to say parent because yeah. it's just, you know, too binary. 
<laughs> They're also walking around in heels in some instances, but that's another story. Uh, we got a $20 super chat by Smashing Random Keys asking, does the GOP plan on training ballot harvesters? If not, I fear the GOP won't win a majority for a while. In some states, in California, there's more organized effort there in uh, states that allow it. Florida does not allow ballot harvesting, so I don't think we should do things that are illegal. And by the way, everyone acts like this election integrity problem is like unsolvable. Like, how will we ever no, totally you know, is. resolve this? And Florida used to be the laughing stock of the country. Oh, yeah. We had the hanging chads and the dimpled chads and the pimpled chads uh, during the 2000 election. Yeah, and then that. we got our shit together and we had yeah. chain of custody requirements for the ballots and we had transparency over how many people had voted in real time. Every eight minutes, every supervisor of election in Florida has to publish how many people have voted, who those people are, what their party affiliation is. And then when you get to the end, there's not like an opportunity for 150,000 ballots to be willed into existence or 10,000 ballots because you know along the way. And if they screw it up and aren't complying with those transparency laws, you get instant access to an injunction in a courtroom where those offices can be put in a state of receivership by the Secretary of State. Right. So we're not going to get screwed over in Florida by this stuff. And if other states would model our laws, they would be more protected. Now, there are some who say, well, we need national laws on these things. And I, that that is perilous. You know, you start nationalizing elections, it's not going to go the way you think it might go when Schumer and Biden and the like get their say in, in how states are doing electioneering. What do you think about federally legislating that companies using proprietary voting machines where the code is secret so you don't know what the programs are doing behind closed doors, that we mandate that they use open source code? I mean, the, the best open source code is a paper ballot. I mean, that's what we've done in yeah. Florida. Like, we don't need your source code if we can go and look at the paper ballots and compare them and do precinct level audits. Because you'll you'll get the canary in the coal mine. I feel like with hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper, that stuff just gets easily lost in the shuffle, literally. Not if you have the right chain of custody requirements. Have you considered doing like a blockchain backup on top of everything? There like, is a lot of talk about the use of blockchain for that very reason. If you do it, use a bunch of different blockchains, like a bunch of them, because one can get hijacked. So like all of them will verify. Yeah. Let's no, that 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 is the next level of election integrity. You guys want to try and find one more real good one? Yeah, I got one more uh, from Rob Hess, the Rob Hess uh, himself. Uh, Gates should have Ilhan Omar get together and put something forward to repeal the Patriot Act. How do you feel about that? I would do it. Ilhan, I'm ready when you are. Oh, great. Right on. All right, everybody, I can barely talk, but this has been an absolute blast. Uh, Matt, you're currently my favorite member of Congress yes, after I what am. went down with the speaker vote because you know we, we had been talking about this for months. For, for the year before the midterms, that no, even if the Republicans win, we don't think we're going to see any real change. And despite the fact that McCarthy is still speaker, I think you did a lot of good. So I got nowhere to go but down now. Yeah. Now that I'm <laughs> in favor, I've, I've got nothing to do but disappoint you, Tim. I hope I that, don't. Well, you know, no, nah, I think it'll be all right. It is what it is. But uh, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends. You can follow the show at Timcast IRL. You can follow me at Timcast. I am taking this weekend to rest my voice obviously. But uh, we will be in D.C. tomorrow at Freedom Plaza. I just probably won't be talking. Matt, do you want to shout anything out? Uh, give me a follow at Rep. Matt Gates yeah. and uh, check out my podcast, Firebrand. We'd love to, love to have some uh, cross-pollination of this terrific audience. Where's Firebrand? Where can people find it? Uh, anywhere you can listen to podcasts. We're, we're pretty much everywhere. Our, most of our audience is Apple. And was that your Twitter account? And what was it again? At Rep. Matt Gates is my Twitter account. Just went over 2 million. Matt. Wow. Nice. Thank you so much for, for coming here and answering our questions. Thank you so much for uh, being here for, for two Where hours. Where is here? Where am I? Middle was, of nowhere. By the way, it was super weird that you made me put the blindfold on on the way here. <laughs> we, I, we I have, thought that was we too much. Safer. Safer. You know. Everyone does that. It's just a couple safety And Was that a calls. goat next to me? Probably, yeah. All right. But a lot of pre people appreciated it, especially in the comment section, and thank you so much for doing it. Um, I just started a new Rumble channel. It's on rumble.com forward slash we are change. I just posted one of my videos there from my members area, Luke Uncensored. Dot com where you get to have a sneak peek at what uh, the kind of videos I do there almost every single day. Rumble.com forward slash we are change. 
for the spicy videos to, um, that you guys could watch right now. Thanks oh, for having me. Thanks for coming, man. Um, more of these. This is fantastic. More, more Congress people coming to shows like this, speaking the word of the American people from the voice of the representative. I'm bringing back up next time, dude. Yeah, Jim Jordan. Friends. We got to bring Jim because you. I didn't know you guys were such good friends, but yeah. we should hear you and Jim go on tech, talk about tech and how we got to deal with big tech. That's really fascinating. I'll make the pitch. Hell yeah, dog. Or Ilhan. Maybe we'll bring Ilhan yeah. and talk yeah. war powers. Sure. Cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm Ian Crossland. Find me anywhere on the internet. Surge, talk me out. I am at surge.com. Also find me anywhere on the internet. Uh, I appreciate your time. This is really, really cool. I also appreciate you nominating Donald Trump. Uh, in the floor. I just <laughs> love hearing that. the groan. It was just so hilarious. And the little, little discussion in the den, it was just like, oh, you can't make that up. Man. The president vote you. was my favorite. Yeah. Uh, all right, everybody, become a member at TimCast.com if you want to support our work and get access to our uncensored members-only segments. Thanks for hanging out, and we will see you all tomorrow in D.C. at Freedom Plaza. Yeah, 10 a.m., 10 a.m. 10.